One, um, as you people can see, we're close to the uh, 200, 250 people on the call. If you could turn off your video because it takes up bandwidth, and maybe you have great bandwidth, but not everybody in all our communities do. So um, if we just have the school committee, there, you can keep theirs on. It also puts the school committee on your Brady Bunch screen, so you're seeing kind of the, the, the members of the committee there. Um, the other thing is if we lose power, for some reason, if everything goes down, we're going to, our, our contingency plan is that we'll wait 15 minutes. I'll try to get everything re-going again and we'll wait 15 minutes and try to restart then. And then we'll wait another 15 minutes. If we're not able to get up and going after a half hour, we'll have to do a postpone, emergency postpone. Um, and I don't know if we can do it the final night. I'll call the attorney immediately and try to find out and get that all posted out there. If you have a, one of those things, um, that kind of thing as well. Um, yeah, people can also call in, people can also stream, and I'll post the streaming thing into the chat as well. Um, you know, if you're sitting there and you don't really want to be sitting there. Um, I'm gonna copy that and put it into stream here. You can stream as well, if you, if you weren't looking to speak this evening and you wanna get off and um, that kind of thing. So I think that's a, overall, that's it. Again, you can take the other rules and stuff moving forward from there. Okay. So did you want to call to order? Or yeah. just... Oh, well, so let me explain this evening since we have so many guests on. So the joint, um, U38 is a, is a, is a, a committee put together of the four towns, which are actually four separate committees. And due to tonight, we have two sets of votes that have to happen tonight. One's just doing some business that we'll get through um, pretty quickly, I hopefully in the beginning here, um, ratification of the teacher's contract, where I have to have each individual um, town um, vote the contract, each little school committee's town and school committee vote the contract. Um, and so what, what I need is each chair of each school committee to call their meetings to order. And then we'll just have Ken run all the meetings together as the, as the union chair. But then when we go to vote, um, later today uh, regarding the model moving forward is again going to go back to each individual chair. Um, Ken will uh, tell you know what town to go forward and then that chair will take over and ask for a vote. So it's in, we are we're working four committees are working together as one but individually each committee has to make the vote. That's how we're set up here in its craziness. Okay any questions on that from the committee members? We have one issue, which Denise Storm is trying to log on, and she said the calls hit 250 maximum, and that won't let her in. <laughs> Tell her to try again, because some people have come off. If, if, folks, if you aren't going to participate tonight, and you want to wish to do streaming, that would be a, a, a nice public service gesture to all of us, because we've never been close to over 200 before. We didn't foresee this happening tonight. So, and we're if, down to 245. Click, I, I posted it in the chat thing there. You just click on that. And you can stream it. So if you weren't planning, you just want to listen in. It actually may even be clearer than doing it this way. All right. So it's coming down to our try again. Thank you for everybody who's doing that. And those who already did it, didn't hear me say thank you, but thank you. Okay. <clears throat> um, so uh, why don't we start with Conway? Elaine, do you want to call to order? Sure, we'll call Conway's meeting to order at 5.09 p.m. And Gregory, it's for Sunderland. Call Sunderland's meeting to order at uh, 5.09 p.m. And Bob for Wheatley. That's oh, Katie. Oh, I'm sorry, I'll Katie for, the, sorry, that's Katie. That's okay, I'll call slip order. there. <laughs> Still 5.09 p.m., meeting call to order. And I will call the Deerfield School Committee meeting to order at 5.09 p.m. So thank you all for that. Uh, just a, again, a couple of housekeeping items. I want to note for those listening in that this meeting is being recorded live and uh, will continue to be so through, throughout its time. This is a, a virtual meeting uh, under Mass General Laws, Chapter 30A, Section 20. Um, and uh, we, uh, we always have to notify people that we are being recorded. So thank you for that, that consideration. We have one piece of unfinished business that um, needs to be taken care of. This is a revote of the ratification of the 2020-2022 Teachers Agreement. 
each individual school committee has to vote this. This was voted in a um, joint meeting back, I believe, on the 15th of July. And uh, we have learned from council that each committee has to vote it individually. So if we could start uh, with the Conway School Committee, we would be re-voting the agreement so that it becomes an official vote. Okay, so Conway, Denise is also on now. So can we uh, have a motion for this um, contract to re-vote this? So moved. Philip. Can I have a second? I'll second. I'll second, Michael Mann. All right. All in fit. Do I need a roll call or can majority? Yes, please. All right. Um, Philip. Yes. Aye. Michael. Michael. He's locked up. He's frozen. He's power again. <laughs> Try another one. <laughs> Conway just lost power again. Is Elaine still there? <laughs> is, is Elaine gone? Yep. Well, then why don't we move? We'll, we'll move to Sunderland. Yeah. <laughs> we'll move to Sunderland temporarily here. <laughs> yeah, uh, can we get a, a motion? I'll move it. I'll move it. We approve the teacher's agreement. This is Peter. Out, outstanding. Peter and second. I like that. I second. Outstanding. All right. I think it was that Jessica and Maisie at the same time. We got the. Yep. Outstanding. All right. Uh, Peter. Yes. Jessica. Yes. Keith. Yes. Maisie. Yes. Greg. Yes. The unanimous. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, Waitley. Uh, could I get a motion to revoke the teacher's contract? So moved. Uh, I, second. I second. Maureen. Okay. Um, go down the roll call. Maureen, your vote. Yes. yes. Bob. Yes. And me, Katie, yes. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, Deerfield School Committee, do I have a motion to re vote? I'll make a motion to re vote and ratification of the 2020 2022 teachers' agreement. Second. second. And was that Carrie? Carrie? Yeah. Okay. Carrie second. And roll call vote. <clears throat> um, David Sharp? Yes. Carrie Etchells? Yes. Mary Raymond? Yes. Trevor McDaniel? Yes, please. Kenneth Cutterback? Yes. So thank you all for, for taking care of that. Um, at this point, as we move on the agenda, I, I do want to make a, a correction to the agenda and note that we um, will be moving to review, discussion, and vote on the final return to school plan. However, public comment through a miscommunication between myself and the central office got put below unfinished business, and it will be moved up above unfinished business at this point in time. I mean, uh, uh, yes, but above the review and discussion, it would not really be appropriate for us to not have public comment on an issue of uh, this magnitude. So we will be having um, public comment tonight. I did want to state that there will be a three minute time limit for comments due to the anticipated number of comments we expect to receive. So you will have three minutes to comment uh, to the committees uh, this evening, only three minutes. Uh, another note I would want to make is that if you have submitted a letter to the committee. Or, I'm sorry. Elaine's that, back on. Somebody took back on. Oh, okay. Just one second, Elaine. Let me just finish a statement here, and then I'll, I'll put you back on for your vote again. We'll see if we get everybody else back. Um, I just wanted to say okay. that if, if you submitted a letter to the committee or central office, 
it has been received and forwarded to all committee members. And I ask in the interest of time that you please not read it out loud during the meeting as a public comment, since it is already part of the public record. I, I'd like to point out that a Sunderland committee member, Jessica Corwin, has done a, a remarkable job of um, summarizing the emails that have been received and, um, you know, putting that information before the committee. So uh, we, we have that information. I don't know if Jessica would be willing to save that in the chat area of the, um, uh, <clears throat> of the, uh, the site that we're on, but um, it's uh, definitely uh, something that that provides information for all to see, and, and it would tell you that that was it. So before we go to the general uh, uh, public comments, I did want to get back to Elaine and see if we've got got our committee back together and can finish their vote. It's a little rough up here in Conway right now, so. Um, I so I'm on my phone now, and Denise, I think, is out again. But let I don't know if we still have Michael and Philip. So anyway, I had a motion and a second. I had you, Philip, I think, said yes. Michael? I say yes. Okay. I say yes. Philip yep. said yes. I say yes. Ashley, I don't know if still on here. On, she yes. was. Up. Oh. She said All yes. Right. Yes, from Ashley, and I think um, Denise is still off. So we have um, all of the four members say yes. Okay, very good. Okay. Thank you. Th thank you very much for that, Elaine. <clears throat> so, um, uh, Ken, this is Jessica. Can I ask um, how you would like this shared? Are you imagining that I'm going to share the, the spreadsheet for everybody to view personal details of people who wrote in? Or should um, I share some aggregate? data i would uh i would think you had um well that's a good question <laughs> i guess just the aggregate data so that they can see that people did did respond i will work on that um but i'll okay. have to take that of formatting from the, the spreadsheet so it'll take me a few minutes Yes, no, that's fine. I, I'm Great. sorry to come out of the blue at you. I discussed it with someone, and they thought maybe it might be possible to sit, share it in the chat section. But you're you're absolutely right. There is some information there that we certainly don't want to to um, have out out there. So, um, so I I ask if you are interested in commenting, um, please send a chat uh, to the chat area. And this evening, we're going to ask if you could please only uh, use that sort of as a means of raising your hand. Um, please don't put comments in here and respond to comments or anything else. It just gets too cluttered, and I have a difficult time following it, and I know others do too, and it, it distracts from other people that are, that are talking. So um, I will uh, – <clears throat> we will go to, from there. So – we are open for public comment, and um, I'm going to the top here to make sure <laughs> we're, we're good. So, got a lot of Conway conversations going on here. Um, so, I'll see where my first, first person is. Victoria Palmer? Yes, hello, good evening, everyone. Thank you, members of the Union 38 school committees, and to those who have worked tirelessly in crafting plans surrounding reopening our beloved community schools. I serve as psychologist and counselor at the Sunderland Elementary School. Like all of my fellow educators, I am really eager to get back to being with students, to the joys of teaching in person and reconnecting with eager, curious children and their wonderful families. While I had considered hybrid as a possible option until recently, current data indicates new phases of resurgence, even in rural areas like ours. This up-to-date information leads me to endorse the safest way to prevent risk is to employ a district-wide remote learning start to our school year. 
data in our area and throughout our country speaks to the uncertainty of this deadly virus, especially when exposure due to social gatherings and togetherness occur on a regular basis, like what is proposed for our school communities. A temporary remote learning approach poses the least amount of risk to community members while preventing dangerous exposure for us all. I'm confident my educator peers will work creatively to reach all of our students to meet their learning needs while promoting re robust learning platforms. Tonight, I ask each of you to thoughtfully consider adopting a remote-only learning platform to begin the academic year to ensure safety and well-being of students, families, faculty, and staff. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. <clears throat> um, Ashley Dennis? Is Ashley still with Thank us? You. I am. Thank you. I had to unmute. I'm sorry. And I apologize. I put my name a second time because I didn't follow the protocol. So don't call on me again. <laughs> um, thank you, committee members, so much for the tireless work that is being done right now. You all are taking on so much and it's so appreciated. Very much like those of us who work in the schools. I'm one of the school nurses at Frontier. I have a child going into eighth grade at Frontier and at Deerfield Elementary. Um, going into fourth grade. And I have submitted letters to the relevant district members. Thank you. I won't reiterate those points, but I did want to just really clarify the fact that the a lot of the people who are speaking up in support of hybrid and even increased in-person services um, are the parents and guardians of students with special needs and that is so important those students really need additional time they need more in-person support i agree with all of that but that is also separated in the DEA, the D, um, desi guidelines we have a place there that talks about prioritizing those students receiving in-person services so i hope that as the committee members think about a choice between remote and hybrid that when we think about um, the sheer number of people, students, faculty, staff that will be present in the buildings that we think, you know, that's that's a lot of people coming in together, even broken up into two co cohorts. And um, I really think we, I, I urge us to, I, I urge you to please, you know, be, be thoughtful, of course, and, and consider a remote start to the school year. I think that allows for the greatest safety at this time. Um, people have been traveling, they're coming back. There's some, and, and it allows for a solid start in remote with safety and not just jumping in and then having to jump out. Um, and, I think that we've now practiced remote. We see what works, what doesn't work, and we can do it really well. So I ask that you consider the remote option as the safest, safest option. And thank you very much for the time to speak. Okay, thank you, Ashley. Mary Dancer. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I am an instructional assistant at Deerfield Elementary School. And what I have to say will not be new news, but I feel it strongly needs to be stated again. In just four weeks' time, the first week of September, Deerfield Academy, Eaglebrook, and Bement will be opening <clears throat> and welcoming students back. Students who come from all over this country and all over the world. At both Deerfield Academy and Eaglebrook, there are family, faculty families whose children attend DES, and there are faculty um, spouses like myself who work at Deerfield Elementary School. My concern is that the domino effect that could happen if we come back to school with in-person learning, even hybrid, at this tentative time of convergence and coming together will be drastic. No matter what stringent safety measures we or they put in place, this could be a perfect storm whose aftermath could mean loss of life. Why take the chance with the lives of our children, our families, staff, teachers, and administration when we have remote learning plans and practices that were used this past spring? strengthen these plans and use them until this deadly pandemic passes and it is truly safe to return. 
we always talk about the safety of our students as being the top priority. Has that changed? Why are we considering putting them, their families, all members of the school and greater community at risk when there's a choice not to? Thank you. Thank you, Mary. <clears throat> Sarah, I'm sorry, I'm just, Holly, Holly Johnson. Hi, I have a, a daughter at Frontier and two at Waitley. I did send in a letter and I won't repeat it. I'm just wanted to give you sort of my top reasons. I'm going to go remote. However, the vote happens tonight. My problem with and I would like I would like the vote to be remote because if you vote hybrid, it affects the remote option for me because my child won't have the same teacher. Um, they won't have the same type of instruction that she would have the regular in-person people have and the remote, the hybrid model, that's an effect. And um, I also think that's not enough time if you go hybrid and then you have to wait for the, the teacher's decisions, it's, there, there's not enough time to really get that in place solidly. And also with the, the special education students being prioritized, if you vote remote, now we have all this time to prioritize those students for in-person learning in a fairly empty building that only, that will be so much safer for those special ed students that need that and for the teachers and IAs that work with them. Um, and they need to be prioritized because I, I, I am not confident that enough work is being done or that we are close to any kind of plan for, for that with the special education. I, you know, I've been to meetings, CPAC meetings, the strategic planning committee, and it's got a long way to go and we don't have a lot of time. And I think remote to start is our best option for a solid plan to be in place by the time we go back. Thank you. And thank you, Holly. And thank you for your comments in previous meetings as well and your work with the CPAC. Uh, Sarah Colsey, if I, if I mispronounce any names, please let me know. <laughs> Is Sarah still with us? Or is she potentially Conway? <laughs> Control D. Sarah, are you there? Yeah, she is. Sorry. She is. <laughs> I apologize. I don't have my 11 year old here to tell me how to do this. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Sarah Colsey. I am a parent of two children. One is at DES going into sixth grade. The other child is going to Frontier into ninth grade. Um, my family 100% is behind the hybrid model. We, as I had explained in my letter to all the committee members, my family has had a tragedy last year, which has overall affected us tremendously <clears throat> mental health wise. The lockdowns and the shutdowns have made it a lot worse. Um, my 11 year old who is an extreme social butterfly has now become very much a loner. Um, he does not hang outside very much with friends anymore. He doesn't want to socialize as much anymore. And even my ninth, ninth grader is having a lot of trouble. Um, he is seeing online bullying to an extreme extent. As parents, we are seeing it as well. And I am afraid that ultimately keeping the kids at remote learning for long periods of time is going to hurt them in the long run for emotional reasons, for social reasons. My, as I've said, my family and I believe that the hybrid model is the best scenario for everybody. It gives the parents that feel the same as myself the chance to send our children to school, and it gives the parents that feel like it is not the right time the opportunity to stay home, let their children do the remote, and then from there, if they feel later on that the hybrid model is better, it gives them the choice to bring their children back. I, I don't want to go into too much details about what has happened with my family, but again, I need to reiterate that the emotional issues of these lockdowns, the emotional issues of the children not being around their peers, not being around their teachers, mm -hmm. is hurting kids more. And I feel, and my husband feels, that the remote learning is ultimately 
the worst for our family and that the cure in essence is worse than the virus. And I want to thank everybody. I know this is a very tough decision and I know that you guys are all working extremely hard on this, but I just, I, I needed to be the voice that said we vote for hybrid because I know there are a lot of us and I know a lot of people are not, not willing to speak up in regards to the hybrid model, but I just wanted to let that known. We that vote hybrid, please. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Sarah Koblen, 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 are you out there? We can try again. Sarah Koblen, Koblen. Not hearing. I would point out that in the chat column, if you want to go to the chat area, if you're still on the um, webcast or virtual meeting, uh, Jessica has been posting uh, data on on the chat. Kathy Luzin, Luzignan, or Carrie, I'm sorry, Carrie Luzignan. It's Carrie Luzignan. Uh, yes. I'm just turning my video on. Sure. Can you see me and hear me? Absolutely, yes. Okay, okay, good. Yeah, I, I'm the one who I think got uh, caused this trouble. <laughs> I'm feeling guilty and pleased that so many people showed up. Um, I, I do want to say thank you first. I've been, I think I've been to every meeting that's been held this summer and I see how hard the teachers have been working in my district, um, Kristen Gordon, uh, Darius. I think um, this is a really difficult situation. Um, I'm going to choose remote regardless of what the school committee votes. So I'm not really on here to push for one or the other because what you vote won't affect me. Um, that said, I, I am on here. Uh, I'm not gonna, I share all the concerns um, that other people have spoken to uh, remote about. So I'm not going to echo those. I want to be efficient because I know there's a lot of people. But what I do want to um, say is that uh, since the meetings began, I have been asking um, that a third option be presented because in all honesty, I don't want remote and I don't want hybrid. And I am feeling frustrated at this point to be so near the beginning of the school year and to have been sort of shouting, it feels like into a void about the possibility of doing outdoor learning and to continue to hit a wall that basically just says, no, nope, not an option. Not, no, we're not going to do that. No explanation why, no attempt to even brainstorm through it. Um, and in my mind, it would benefit people who want hybrid as much as remote, because my sense of the hybrid is that two half days a week or two full days a week really aren't going to help a lot of working parents that much. And from what I'm seeing out there, uh, there are schools, many schools who are getting creative and kids are able to do outdoor learning. And the idea of a couple of months of connecting outside and at the very least, I guess I would like to ask the school committee to consider if that you don't want to have a third thing to vote on, if I'm, if I'm breaking the rules by even proposing it, I'd like to ask you to consider that if you vote for remote, that something outdoors be provided on a regular basis. I know Four Rivers is going remote and they're offering two times a week something outside where the students can get together because as a psychotherapist who specializes in this stuff the social emotional piece is key um so that's all I, that's all i'm gonna say i think that's enough um okay. well thank you carrie well thank you for thank you for your comments and, and your suggestions um let's see who i've got next aja aja Saron. Hi, um, I'm Asia Cerrone, and I share the CPAC. It's a hard name. It's okay. <laughs> no, I should have remembered from the last meeting. Sorry. Right. <laughs> um, we are urging the school committee to ensure that the district follows DESE's special education guidance, regardless of which model is voted in tonight. Specifically, we would like assurances that to the greatest extent possible, the district will offer in-person special education services 
and to all the students who qualify under DESE's definition of complex and significant needs. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Aja. So, <clears throat> is it, I believe, I've got to see, um, Aaron DeMaio? Or DeMaio? Yes, yes. I don't know if you can see me on here. Yes, but, we can. Uh, Yes, we can. So I, I just wanted to comment and um, I guess in, in, in uh, favor of a hybrid model. And I think I'm maybe commenting on this from a little bit of a different perspective, because as a healthcare worker and a dentist, we have, uh, you know, three offices and we have been back working uh, in people's mouths for the past three months. And probably uh, there's no greater risk in any profession on the planet than ours. And what I would say is that um, I would agree with a lot of people that the social emotional piece for these children and their contact with their peers, uh, as well as trying to limit their screen time is exceptionally important. And um, by no means do we want to sacrifice safety of kids and teachers. But I feel like after being back, I, I can relate to many people's fears. My t I have 35 employees and I treat them like family, and they were all very scared to come back. And when they came back and we were wearing the appropriate protective equipment, you know, they felt better. They felt good to be with our patients. They felt at ease. They felt a smile in their eyes, even wearing a mask to see their colleagues. And we are, have been working safely in a, in a profession that has at far greater risk than any teacher would be at in terms of drilling in someone's mouth uh, and we have come back and we have found out that we can do this and, and we can do it safely with the proper protective equipment so my proponent is i think we can do it i think there's a fear of the unknown and i'm living it at a far greater risk than any teacher would ever live it i would also like to say that many of the teachers who are afraid to come in are readily bringing their kids into my office for treatment. So they are not afraid. We have hourly workers in my office that are, you know, shouldering the burden of keeping our community going. And I think that, you know, it, it would be a privilege for them to stay home. And I think that, you know, many of the services that all of us on this call are consuming. You look at a supermarket, there are 200 people at a time in those supermarkets. Those checkers are working there so that you can buy your food that you can bring this home to your family. They're hourly workers. Um, they, um, we, you know, I'm wearing a mask and a shield. And so I think that teachers could wear a mask and a shield as well. And that would be uh, very protective at the same time. It would be giving these kids that social emotional peace that they all crave. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. <clears throat> um, I see in between names here that Carol, Carol Kirkalonis is asking, where is this data from? The data that Jessica has been posting is a summation of all the emails that have been received by the full committees since July 20, July 28th, uh, not July 28th, uh, June 20th, July 8th or something like that. It's a, it's a it's compilation. A it's a week What's, ago, the start of last week's meeting. Oh, just last week, okay. So it was July 28th. Um, that's that's the feedback that we have been receiving. So that's where it's coming from, Carol. Um, hey, can can I just do a point of order, please? Yes. Just real quickly. I, mean, I know it's tempting to turn the, the chat function into a chat line, but the, the proper point of order in a in a school committee meeting is is that comments are addressed to the chair, and the chair um, does that. If we allow comments to go back and forth in the chat. It's going to turn. It's going to turn on civil, I think, and I, I'm just concerned about that. It's a difficult decision as it is. You have a chance to give your opinion. Give it. Respect other people's opinions. And don't combat it by commenting on the on the chat line. Sure. Thank you, Darius. I just got into some of the comments and was about to ask the same. So, um, Carol, Karen Coleman, back, uh, Carrie, Sarah Koblin. We already heard. Did we hear from Sarah? Uh -oh. Sarah, did you have a comment? 
Yes. Hi. Sorry. I, um, oh, there you are. I, I fell out of the call is what happened. So that's OK. Great. Thank you. So I, I just want to thank the committee um, and teachers and staff who've, who've done incredible work. It's in sort of an untenable um, situation. And I want I'm, I'm in favor. I'm not in favor of, go, of sending kids back into school. I think it's a it's an incredible amount to ask of teachers to um, try to manage classrooms and, with kids and protective equipment. Um, I don't, you know, I think we see it being done in essential services, like in supermarkets and dentist's office and other practices, but those are adults. There's many less of them in the space. These are, you know, these are kids who want to, you know, touch their friends and who don't know what six feet is in some cases. Um, and I, I guess, and I realize there's two options, right? There's remote and there's hybrid, but I really feel like the remote has potential for more social emotional learning, right? So I don't, I'm not sure what the, you know, reimagining social emotional, like it's gonna be like it's been in the past, but social, social and emo, emotional learning um, across personal protective equipment is gonna be very different. And so, I think with remote, it does not have to mean there's no contact, right? It can mean there's creative opportunities for outdoor learning, for small pods, for regional um, kids to come together um, and, and for outdoor learning to occur. Like, you know, like there's a lot of great work being done around the country looking into these modes of education. Um, that is not simply put a ton of kids together or keep them all at home behind their screens, right? I think it looks, it feels like those are the two options, but I feel like a choice for remote means we might, we can open it up to regional collaboration, small social pods, keeping kids outdoors, distance, um, and not have to uh, put t our teachers at risk. And um, yeah. Out there. I had another I had another thought there, but I think it just it just left me. Um, so anyway, yes, yeah, I really I oh no, I sorry, my other thought was regarding special ed, right? So if we do remote and then we have this uh, special focus on kids who absolutely need to get back into the school, like special ed kids or kids with super under resourced families, then that we have an environment, we have an environment where, you know, we can have teachers who feel comfortable doing that, get into the classroom um, with those kids and do that and give them the attention that they deserve without also having to think about coordinating uh, tons of other people in and out of rooms. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Megan Ashman. Hello, hi, am I on there? Yes. Yes. Okay, hi. So I, I, um, I appreciate everybody's work that they're doing and the decision that you have to make is extremely hard right now. Um, I wanted to come on in, um, I am all about the hybrid model. I think that that's what's going to work the best. There are so many kids, not just students in one elementary school or the high school or wherever, but in this district, we have to really take a second to think about the kids that are being neglected that the school is their safe place to be during the week. There are some kids in our school district that don't get fed meals, that don't have a safe place at home, who don't have access to the remote learning option that somebody, you know, they also need to be considered. You know, their parents may not be on this call. Um, they may not get attention at home that you need for remote learning. But I do think that that needs to be put into consideration. Yes, a lot of people in our district have a wonderful home life that you know their parents are able to take off work to sit with them on a the computer and help them with work and help them with remote learning. But there's also a lot of kids that are struggling and they're home all day by themselves. So putting that in along with you know having special needs say, if that's a combination of the two and they're not getting anything at home to help they're just falling further and further and further behind. So, you know, as somebody that has taught in the school and has worked with students at Frontier that have emotional and social needs that they only get from their teachers and they don't have that at home, I just feel like that also needs to be taken into consideration today because that sometimes school is their only safe place. Sometimes 
they don't they don't feel safe at home they don't get food at home they don't get any attention at home and the only emotional adult that they have the emotional like connection that they have with adults is the teachers at school and are the teachers at school and are their peers at school and gym class and things like that that we also need we just really need to think about them before we make a decision about 100% remote because i just worry there's there's so many kids that are going to be affected more you know the mental health side of this than just just not being you know in school every day so i think it just needs to be looked upon with not just the education side but the mental health of these children from preschool to senior year like there's a lot of social and emotional growth that happens in that time frame and when we're holding them back at home if that's not being taken care of as much and that's all i have to say <laughs> okay thank you megan Lisa, Lisa Zadwarny. Zadwarny. Nice. Are you job. still here? Yes, I am. Can you see me? Yes, Lisa. We can. Okay. Um, so I've been a teacher for 34 years. 21 of them have been at Sunderland Elementary School. I love my job. I bring my job home with me every day. I still communicate with my third grade students from the past year and students from years beyond that. The situation that you are asking teachers to be in is not a one-on-one -on -one like a doctor and a patient. It is not a controlled setting like many of the settings that people are talking about. I am a grocery employee. I work at Whole Foods. My exposure to the people who come through the line is five minutes at a most at a time. I can then sanitize after every, and am asked to sanitize after every person who comes through the line. I do not own a six foot long pencil. I cannot see a child's work from six feet away. There's pieces that I feel like people are not entertaining. I am not a therapist. I am not a nurse. I do not want a mistake that I make where I make a mistake in sanitizing or don't recognize a symptom to cost a child their life. And I'm tired of feeling shamed by people who are saying that I want to take the easy way out. I want the community to hear that it's not a teacher's responsibility to make up for every social service that has been pulled from our communities. I have been asked to be a nurse. I have been asked to be a therapist. I want to be all those things. I am not a trained medical profession, professional. And asking me to be responsible for the safety of a group of children, if I make a mistake and that child is ill or someone in their family is ill and there is an issue I will not be able to live with myself. And I want you to think about it from that perspective. More than anything, I want to be back with my kids. But I can't ex even fathom what it would be like to be in a classroom and not be able to hug the children in front of me. When you talk about social emotional well being, what is it going to feel like to a child behind a lucite plate who can't touch me, who I can't touch? who I can't help. When we talk about helping social and emotional development, that's not what will happen. I want it to happen, and I do not want to feel like the people who are not in my position are shaming me into doing something like that. And that's how it feels from my, per my perception. And I think a lot of people and a lot of teachers are afraid to say it. I feel bullied. I'm supposed to teach students not to bully and not to be a bystander. And I think you need to think about those things before you take your vote. I respect everyone that is has a perspective. You all have a right to your own perspective. I'm a passionate teacher. I want to be with my kids. But I don't want to be responsible for someone dying. And that's all I have to do. Thank you, Lisa. <clears throat> uh, Shelly Yagodzinski. Yes. Can you hear me, see me? Yes. Yeah. So, again, I think that um, 
there's a great deal of appreciation to the school committee members as well as the community to deal with this extremely difficult situation and this task that, that you have at hand. Um, and much like the speaker that just went before me, I do feel a little bit of the same sentiment. I am for the hybrid model. I was actually for going back to school 100%. And, and I do feel um, like some of the other speakers, like Sarah and Aaron, that we are the silent majority and that we do believe that the best thing for the social and emotional feelings of our children is that they, they need to be back in school. Um, a, a few of the teachers have mentioned that they feel like they've gotten the quirks out of the remote learning and I can I can appreciate that and I you know I do think that the remote learning has its place but but you guys cannot be replaced you guys are the professionals you guys have the one with the education you guys are priceless to our children in your interaction with with our children I am not a I am not a teacher um, I I believe that I didn't even do half as Good of a job as as you guys do with with my kids um and i know that how much my my children and the relationships that my two kids have had with the the staff and faculty out at, at waitley elementary um you know again i don't want to go down the rabbit hole of of dealing with the data but i do feel like there's data all over the place where you know kids may may not carry and train transmit the disease like adults do. Um, and, and to Aaron's point, there have been essential workers and there have been daycares and then have been grocery store clerks that have been back to work for this entire time. And we do know more about the disease and as uh, what we can do um, to prevent that. So my my feeling is, is that I feel like the kids need structure. We are not in a city school. We are not in a hot spot. We are in a rural area where the student population, specifically of WES, is very small. It's very manageable. And I think that it's more detrimental to keep the kids at home than going to the hybrid model. And again, thank you for, for all you all are doing and thank you for your time. <clears throat> thank you, Shelly. Mr. Chair, this is Jessica Corwin. Can I make a quick comment? Sure. I'm not sure that everybody was here when you asked people who have already written to not also use public comment. Everybody remaining who said they'd like to comment has already emailed us. Okay. Um, well, let's, we'll, we'll find out. <laughs> we've got, yeah, we've got what, two more, I believe. Um, Sarah. Nope. Or, three more. <laughs> okay. Um, as as Jessica pointed out, these are three people that have already commented via state written statements. But uh, Sarah Shiverini, Shiverini. <laughs> yeah, it's Kiaverini. You were close. Kiaverini. <laughs> it's okay. You were close. <laughs> um, I just I wanted to read the letter that I shared with some of the committee members because. Um, I feel like a lot of us have our own thoughts and opinions about what the different models will look like. Um, but I really just kind of wanted to help people put a picture in their mind of what school will look like next year if we go back hybrid. Um, um, I, Sarah, course, if I, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but I, I, did, I did mention earlier in the meeting that if you want to make a comment, that's great. We've already received your letter. Everyone on the committees has received your letter. You may not be aware of that, but uh, we, we received it and uh, everybody's had a chance to read it. Um, can I so just read one part of it for people? You can read one part of it, but that, that would be fine. I just didn't, okay. I didn't want to have us reinvent the wheel. So no, go ahead. Okay. Um, I just wanted to draw one picture in your mind for you. Um, so I'm a fourth grade teacher at DES, um, and I'm really concerned about the fallout that's going to occur if we go back to school in person in any way. Um, a lot of my colleagues have shared a lot of the information that um, was in my letter, um, so I'll just share one part of it. And I'm hearing a lot of people saying that children need to socialize, and they're missing out on being with their friends. Um, and I just want you to picture a classroom where every single child is six feet apart, or only half their class is in their classroom, and the other half of their class is in a different room. 
They have to wear masks. They can't share supplies. They can't even play together. They can't even face each other without some sort of shield between them. There's no recess. They can't move throughout the classroom freely. Does it sound like there will be much socializing? No. They're better off, like Sarah Koblen mentioned, kind of forming a, a social bubble outside of school with two friends where they always play together or going to a playground every once in a while with a mask like we've been doing. So I'm hearing a lot of people talking about the social and emotional well-being of these children. And I feel like as a teacher who works with these kids, it would almost have a negative effect. It would be traumatic to these kids to put them in this environment if that's not the school that they're missing. All right. Thanks, Ken. Okay. No, thank you, Sarah. I, I didn't. I didn't mean to cut you off, but I, no, it's okay. it, it just. I just wanted you to be aware that everybody has seen it. Uh, Michelle okay. Tomlin. Michelle Tomlinson. Is Michelle still with us? Yep. I'm trying to hop on now. You guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so I did, um, as Jessica said, send in an email, but I did want to add something that wasn't said in the email and um, that I feel like the hybrid model is being talked about as this option that uh, sounds sustainable when um, I don't think that it is. I think that come cold and flu season, we'll be scrambling like this all over again um, to create something that might be more sustainable. Like it may just go full remote anyway. So the thought is that maybe if we do go full remote now um, that we can create pods and social emotional uh, support in that way, um, put all of our academics into the full remote models and then the social emotional can be um, pulled in with our community. Um, just for instance, there's that FRSU connect on Facebook that we now have over 405 members and there's a lot of micro schooling talk and pods um, and that can all support this remote uh, learning and we can do all that you know social stuff outside where it's safer um, indoors just doesn't make any sense at all for part of the hybrid model um, i just feel like there's just not enough um, ventilation and not enough of space in that. I think the only safe option to keep everybody very, very safe is remote with um, community support and pods. That's it. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Michelle. Um, I have, it's capital A, B, D, K, and I can't remember the couple's name. So. No, that's okay. This is Amanda Wygant and Ruben Baker. There we go. Um, our daughter is at Sunderland, and I, I did submit a, an email, but I wanted to make comments that were not sure. included that after hearing some of the statements tonight and to the core I think we need to listen to our teachers and our staff members because forced work is not inspired work and they are scared as they should be to go back under these circumstances we're seeing bad reports out of schools opening schools day camps outside learning where this is spreading uncontrollably. Nothing with COVID has changed, except for we're seeing higher numbers in children and widespread spreading through communities. Hybrid is not sustainable right now. And I think addressing the issue of special needs kids and those who are insecure in whatever fashion they are and finding a solution for them, but keeping everybody else remote is the safest option for those who we rely on the most for our children <laughs> and those in our community who are compromised. Our school communities go a lot further than just us as parents and our kids. It's everyone in our community communities. And so I really, I treasure our staff at SES, as I'm sure everyone else in this community does at their own schools. That's why we're here. Um, and I want them and their families to remain safe. And I think that the teachers and staff should have a larger voice in this than any parent thinking of an individual circumstance. And that's all I'm going to say. Thank you for your consideration. And, and thank you for your comments and, and your written comments as well. Um, Jessica Pacheco. 
Pacheco? Pacheco. Pacheco. Hi, can you Pacheco. hear me? <laughs> um, yes. I just wanted to parent, parent a little bit what Asia said and just remind committee members that um, a lot of us have kids who were not able to access the remote learning curriculum in any way because we either couldn't get our kids to attend to anything remote or even get them to sit in the front of a commu computer because of their special needs. Um, so I think when voting, um, you know, like the previous speaker said, I think there needs to be some separate something for, for kids who have special needs because we've, um, you know, our kids have kind of been left on the back burner since March, um, and there's nothing specifically addressing their needs. Um, I couldn't even get my daughter to sit for a remote session without crying. Um, so, so full remote is not even accessible to us, or and the curriculum and academics are not accessible to her in any way if we go full remote. Um, and that's all I wanted to say. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Jessica. Um, Sarah Cheney, I guess, or just Sarah. <laughs> under Justin Cheney's heading here? Is there a Sarah Cheney out there? Or a Justin Cheney? I think they're just applauding Sarah. Oh, okay. Oh, is that what that is? That's an emoji. I don't have my glasses on, that's the problem. Uh, Beth Riley, one quick question. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Um, I did send in a letter and I want to thank you all, um, but I just have one question um, based, um, basically about the remote model, if that is chosen. Um, the reason it worked somewhat in the spring is because all other businesses were closed and parents were able to be home. Um, if the remote model is chosen now with all other businesses being open, for those families who have two working parents, are teachers going to be available at night and on the weekends when those children are home and able to be online? So, um, I, I don't think I have an, <laughs> <laughs> I know that a, a total answer. I know what many, many of the faculty would say, yes, they would be available, but I'm not sure the classes would be taught at night and on the weekends. So, but that's, uh, I'll leave that for when we get around to discussing the plan. I believe that, um, Jessica, you are the last name. Oh, Molly Morin. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Um, so I just wanted to chime in because we are a family of two working people and two working parents. And um, I just wanted to say that we are very, very much for the hybrid model. Um, we work all day and our only alternative at this point in order to um, make sure that our son is being cared for because we can't work from home because even if we could work from home that wouldn't get his studies covered um, would be to pay a lot of money right now for programs that are trying to provide kind of a gap coverage and at least if we go with the hybrid model we'll be able to afford it um, honestly to to be quite honest if we go fully remote we will not be able to afford care for our child. Um, and that would require one of us quitting our jobs, which we also cannot afford. And these are all really big, real issues. My son has been going to summer camp over the summer. Um, it, we were very, very fortunate that the emergency child care was at no cost to us. So we were able to afford a summer care for him. And I just wanted to chime in and say that they have been following all the proper protocols. All the children have been wearing their proper PPE. And it has been a wonderful experience for him to socialize with other children. So I know a lot of people are trying to paint a picture that it is traumatic, um, but there have been no cases. Our children have been um, temperature checked. They have been wearing their masks. My six-year-old with behavioral issues has been loving changing his mask up every day. And I just wanted to chime in and say that it is possible, I think, and that um, I wish I wish everyone would at least consider that um, you know for us working parents, it would be really important to um, to have at least partial care throughout the week. Okay, I, I see one last comment that I will take. Uh, it's coming from Emily Tynan. So uh, thank you. Uh, by the way, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to not say thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, and uh, Emily, are you there? Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, if you don't know who I am, my name is Emily Tynan. I'm a second grade teacher in Conway. I'm also the president of the Union 38 Teachers Association. Um, 
And I just want to say that uh, I've been a little disheartened by the lack of unity by all of us. Um, I hear everyone's fears. I hear everyone's struggles. We have to remember that all of us are going through this. We are all going through this horrible, difficult time. Teachers are scared. Parents are scared. No one has an answer. But if we want to get through this, we have to stay together. There's teachers who want to go back. There's teachers that really are fearful. As the union president, I'm going to support both of them and make sure whichever voice they have, they're going to be safe in their workplace. And I just, I just want us to remember and keep that in the forefront of our mind, that we all have these struggles. And I have two young children. I'm, I'm in favor of remote, but if we do go remote, it's quite possible that I can't even continue my job because I'll need to support my kids, and I can't afford to do that. So I just want you to remember that teachers have these same struggles as well, but we really do want to support all families, no matter what model is chosen. And we're not going to give up on your students. We're not going to give up on your families. But I would really encourage all of us to stay united through this struggle. And thank you to the school committee for everything you have done. And I would also, just as one last aside, um, I would really like to thank all the administrators. Uh, we talked with Darius today, our first kind of negotiating se session, and I just feel like we have a strong relationship and we're all going to get through this together. All of the principals have been working endlessly, even through their vacations. We, we have thought of everything. We really have, whether or not you've heard about it out in the public, we, have, we, have, we hear you. We do. Keep reaching out. We're going to keep responding. We're going to keep listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emily. That's, I believe, a, a good segue um, so into- Ken, You've missed a question from Mary Ellen Sloan, I see. I missed a question from Mary Ellen Sloan. Oh, I'm sorry, Mary Ellen Sloan. <laughs> you have a, still have a question? <laughs> I do still have a question. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. I was just wondering if, um, if we decide not to open at this point, um, what the safety measure or what we would be looking for for the benchmarks for safety to open at some point knowing that a vaccine is not guaranteed there's no timeline guarantee for a vaccine um if not now what what are we looking for is my question i think uh I, I obviously can't give you an answer to that, but I think that's the, the million dollar question and really the elephant in the room for everyone um, and, and anyone working with a response to the, to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so I, there are um, benchmarks and uh, numbers that are in the plan or have been sent out to the uh, committees and, and included in the, in the draft that we're considering tonight for the plan. So uh, there are some numbers that could be considered. Um, how, how that would take place would have to be, would, would evolve over time. But um, so, so let's, let's leave the discussion to, uh, to, to control, hopefully answer some of your questions, Mary, okay? Hopefully that will, that will suffice. Um, I just wanted to make a couple of general comments before I turn it over to Darius. We're at the point where I am closing public comment. We will be proceeding to a review, discussion, and vote on the final return to school plan. Um, I, I, I wanted to lay out for, for people that are attending a, a meeting like this for the first time and uh, just for the committees in general to understand what's happening tonight. This is a meeting to discuss the re reopening plans uh, for the Union 38 schools. The school district is required, or the schools are required to submit plans to the Department of Environment, Elementary and Secondary Education, or what you've heard people referring to as DESI. I don't know where department came from, but, um, uh, and I can't remember the exact date, but it's, it's looming on the horizon. So this meeting is intended to be a general discussion of the plan followed um, by individual committee votes. I, um, I wanted to say, as we, as we proceed to this discussion, um, I don't know who that is, but uh, 
this is a, the reopening plan, if I can give a bit of a history to those that haven't been involved as uh, intensively as many of the listeners that are out there tonight have been. This be, began back in the spring, really, but on June 3rd, the school committees met to receive um, uh, an outline of the committees that were being established to draft a reopening plan for uh, Union 38 schools and Frontier Regional School. On the 15th, we received an update of those committee, um, uh, the committee progress to date. And I would point out that the um, administration and staff and others had come together and formed eight committees looking at eight different areas of the schools, all that interrelate ultimately in, in the operations of the school. But these committees were in examining a possible reopening of schools or the plans to reopen schools based on their areas of interest and then meeting with others to discuss the overlaps. Um, on the 15th of June, we received an update. At that point in time, Mr. Modesto informed us that um, the committees would continue to work on the plans, but that his administrative team that had been working tirelessly since March responding to the various issues arriving out of um, the closing of school and uh, everything else that went with our spring experience, that he was instructing them to take a couple of weeks off at the end of June. Keep in mind, we were not yet at the end of the 2020 school year at this point in time. So I thought that uh, this was well-intentioned and very valuable. Hopefully the administrators did what he told them and stayed away as much as they could for a two week period of time. Uh, he said that they would, we would return in July, hopefully the first or second week of July with a draft reopening plan. We have met as a joint committees on July uh, 15th, 27th, and today, um, and have been receiving information from everyone. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to Darius, thank you to Sarah Mitchell, Kim, Karen, the principals, countless faculty, staff, parents that have served on these committees, and also all of you members of the various school committees. People have been working for thousands of hours at work, meetings, and providing feedback that went into the development of this reopening of the reopening plans for Union 38 and Frontier Regional Schools. The school committees are charged with approving plans. Does that mean these plans are cast in concrete? This discussion tonight is on the current draft of the plan. I trust that our administration, faculty, and staffs will continue to work tirelessly revising whatever plans are put forward tonight and adapting them. Uh, as I read through various communications from Mass Association of School Committees, D DESE, and others, I saw a word that uh, popped out and it came from an MASC advisory to school committees and it talked about pivoting. I think everyone would agree that's listening tonight that the unknowns in this COVID-19 pandemic are just beyond anything we've witnessed in the past. Whatever plan we decide on tonight, as people have pointed out in their feedback, as people have said in their comments here tonight, there's no guarantee that it will continue as it's passed. There will most likely be surges, there will be reactions to whatever's happening with COVID-19 in the state of Massachusetts, in the United States, worldwide. It's going to be an ongoing process. It's not going to end with whatever decision is made tonight. And I know Darius has told me his plans are to continue the process of communication um, and cooperation that Emily just alluded to in her, her wonderful summary statements. Um, so I want to personally thank Darius, his administrative team, the principals, the faculty, the staff, the parents, everyone that's been involved in this process. And with that, I can turn it over to Mr. Modesto. <laughs> 
So, Ken, uh, I thank you for the kind words and such, and thank you everybody for their comments tonight and all the endless amounts of um, emails and, and thoughts on this. I don't know where you want me to take it, Ken. I think I really probably should open up the school committee to answer questions. Okay. Um, I mean, I could write, I could answer questions about some of the comments that were made, but I think we'd be better off. Let's let, let's let the committee kind of take off with this. Okay. Well, could I suggest one thing, Darius? Yep. Uh, I just need to find the document. Um, <laughs> You, you did send out uh, the protocol for potential school or district closure, and I'm not sure um, if that's been covered in full or how, how you feel or, or what. But, sure. Uh, yeah, I'll, I, mean, I, I can go on that a little bit and talk a little bit about, um, I guess I could talk a little bit about what hybrid means, at least to me administratively wise. So let me talk about the protocol for, for closure. So basically, I was on with, the, with my buddy Jeffrey, um, Jeff Riley, the Commissioner of Education, earlier this week. Um, I say buddy because they're on with like 400 people. The, um, and he is said that the state is also going to come out with protocols for data markers for closure of school. So we put some together, you know, with some help of neighboring districts. And I've also sent it off. It's probably probably being discussed currently right now at the Board of Health meeting, the regional Board of Health meeting that was at, I think it was at 4.30 or 5 this afternoon. Um, and um, uh, Carolyn Ness, the select board chair from um, Deerfield there is, is has brought that with her, our draft for the area to kind of look at as well. So um, anyway, so we have these, we're going to have these markers about, you know, if we see cases in, in growth within our community and will that, um, you know, should we be cutting, you know, you know uh, closing school because of that. Um, so looking at that, and as I said, the state's going to come out with some as well. Um, uh, we'll see who's, you know, if we want to be more, uh, more conservative with our numbers, we certainly can be. Um, I think the other thing, you know, we heard a lot of comments about, you know, you know, looking at a hybrid model of remote is, how, is kind of how I've been talking to people about it the last couple of days. You know, the hybrid model, I, I see this as the process moving forward. So we gave a general overview of what we're trying to do is getting students back into school at least half the week in person um, and then growing that even more as time goes on. Um, I did have a conversation with the union today and, you know, in some of their concerns, uh, we may have we may have to play with the opening weeks a little bit. And so I may, you know, I'm going to ask that I bring it back to school committees, um, you know, uh, by the, I ask that we have individual school committees the third week of August, because we also have a lot of individual stuff to talk about each school, but kind of update these plans and kind of show what that rollout can look like. Because we have been talking about the, the, the uncertainty and the fears there as well. Um, and, you know, how can we change things to make people um, more comfortable? The idea of being outside, we've been talking about it all along, but we haven't been kind of hammered at home, like, what does outside look like? Can students be out for a certain percentage of the day? You know, those are all things each school, I really need a teacher's involved in that conversation because I can't, it's just as hard to say you're going to go outside and teach your class as it's going to say you're going to teach your class six feet apart in the classroom. Because there's a lot of things that have to do with that. And there's also promises that there's a lot of resources that happens inside the building that we can't be promised to be outside all day long. You got bathrooms, you got nurses services, someone falls and gets a boo-boo on the knee, and they're gonna have to go inside the building. If parents are saying, I don't want my child only outside, well, we have to be realistic when we're talking about all students. You know, you know, sometimes we talk about students participating in certain things. When we open our schools, we're trying to reach all of our students, from those with, with high needs to those um, that, 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 that are on the other end that are sailing away with the book. You know, we, we really have to be everybody in between all the disabilities, all the um, quirks that make up our kids, you know. And so um, when, when I talk about the full plan, we have to consider all that. Kind of thing. So, you know, I think that this plan is going to change a little bit. Um, but what I'm looking for tonight is if it go to the hybrid model is basically what the school committee is saying is that we want the administration and, and teachers and community to work toward bringing students back in person as safely as possible. Okay, and and as quickly as possible, but it's going to, have to be working together. And quickly might be a little bit slower than some people are going to want. But that, that's kind of the thing. Remote. There's a lot of other questions that come to remote. If we go to the remote model. Um, I think we're going to have to look at what what constitutes um, us changing for how long. You know what I mean? We you know and you know and when do we look at this again? You know what I mean? Because if we're going to go remote, are we going to just should we wait till after winter? You know, six months. You know. Is it, not, you know, 45 days, you know, is it, you know, that kind of thing. I think we're going to need some direction. And I guess you could even vote remote and then say, we'll talk about it at the next meeting. I just want to put it out there that you're going to have to give administration some direction because 
there's a lot of people want to do a lot of things with remote and um, and also special education services, we talk about remote, look a little bit differently because the state really is pushing that we try our, our hardest to do in person or something like that um, with special education, um, especially for the higher needs students. So in the remote model, there's still gonna be a little bit of hybrid for special needs in some capacity, which I know makes everything kind of confusing, but the state really didn't set up this plan, I'll be honest, the state didn't set up this plan for schools to be choosing remote. They really set up for a hybrid or everybody back when they really laid out these groundwork. Um, and so that's kind of how we entered it. and everything's kind of shifted over the summer. So it's been a little bit of a moving target. And that's why there is some, that's why there's a lot of confusion here and there as we go through this. But that's, I hope that clarifies a little bit and can I give it back to you to take it from there. Okay, I, I saw Trevor's hand up and Bob's hand up. I'm gonna ask people because I only have nine nine faces on my screen. I haven't figured out how to expand it, I guess. Um, and uh, so if you can just in the ch chat area, please um, send me a, a heads up that you want to talk. Uh, but Trevor, you start. Bob, you'd be second. Okay. And I, I would ask that this only be school committee members that are uh, raising a hand. Uh, the public has had their chance to speak, and I, I don't need any more comments in the chat section. It's hard enough seeing the names as they pop up. Thank you. <clears throat> Trevor. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank everyone for attending tonight and, um, and all the members of the community that have sent emails and letters uh, to me and other members, um, uh, the teachers, parents, grandparents, past teachers and administrators. Um, all of that information has helped you know, shape my view on what's happening. And um, it, it's, it's just a lot to take in. So um, not all of you are aware, um, but I am, you know, I have, I have a unique seat uh, at the table here tonight because I serve on the elementary uh, school committee for Deerfield. I also sit on the select board for the town of Deerfield and on the board of health for the town of Deerfield. So this has allowed me to have access to uh, good information, but also the best minds um, looking at this. Um, this may be uh, the most important decision I'll make in my career as a, as a public servant. Um, and uh, this may sound a bit strange, but it is not a, a very hard decision because I, I based the, this decision on science preparation information, not on fear so much. Um, that's not to say that I'm not fearful uh, you would have to be out of your mind not to be fearful or concerned with what's going on. Um, however, I am confident in my, I'll just speak kind of my, my views on this, in my vote uh, to return our children to a, to a hybrid model. Um, I know that um, the work that Darius and his team are doing, uh, I know as a board of health, I will be, uh, I'll be on this administration uh, const for, for constant check-ins and updates. Um, you know, I want weekly um, updates, you know, information from, from the administration as we start. There, there's a lot to roll out here. Um, but as a Board of Health, we're going to be looking at, you know, what is going on. And, uh, you know, for the first few, few weeks and, and months as we open up, I, I expect there to be change. I expect that, you know, people are going to get a little more comfortable. Um, and uh, or or not, and we're going to have to we're going to have to as as other somebody else said is to pivot. Um, we we can't just be com completely rigid in what our decision is tonight. Um, but but I, I you know I feel very confident in this community to keep doing what they have been doing to keep us all safe. Um, I know that we can and will change. Um, you know, based on advice and and um, the other board members and nursing staff will be watching like a hawk at, at, you know, at the indicators that are going on. Um, I know that we have amazing public health staff in, in place to, you know, to do the contact tracing, the quarantine and the isolation if needed. Um, we, you know, um, we know what's going on in this community. I, I've, you know, I've been on the select board for four years, board of health for four years, um, chaired last year. So I've been able to, um, work regionally with FERCOG, with, you know, Lisa White, uh, our regional health nurse, um, all the different people working alongside Carolyn Ness. Um, if anybody is into public health and knows what's going on and has their pulse on the thing, 
you know, finger on the pulse, it's, it's Carolyn Ness. Um, so we have been working, you know, diligently day and night, you know, constantly on what's happening locally. What are the cases? What's the exposure here? Who's, you know, who needs to be trained more on protection? Um, we've had a, we've had it very, very good. I thought when this started off, we would be in a lot worse shape. Um, but this community has really stepped up and, and made sure that their children are safe, that their families are safe, their, their parents are safe, grandparents, seniors. Um, they have been, you know, they've been taking all kinds of steps to do the right thing. And that's what's kept our, you know, our caseload very, very low. I mean, I, I look back at 16 cases we've had in our community. Um, and this is just Deerfield, but you know, each one of those cases are different. They're not all a positive case. They are, you know, a suspected case, um, you know, and we know what those cases are. We know that, um, you know, it's, it's not like we have no idea where these cases come from. Like we're, we've got five or six cases and we don't know how they're connected and we don't know what we're, you know, where they're coming from, who they've been in contact. We know everything that happens when a case comes up. And a case may just be, hey, I'm not sure and I'm getting tested, or I may have had it back in April and I just wanna be sure now. That's a case. So when you hear you have a case, it doesn't mean we have active cases in the community and we're rampant with this disease. It means that you know people are being cautious and they're getting tested and they wanna know, had they, did they have it back in January when all this started or February? So there's, there's multiple steps to this. Um, we know that as soon as we get notified, I get notified instantly all day long. If we have a case, goes in it, it goes into Maven. We you know we jump on it. Lisa jumps on it. We have our other other uh, nursing staff that jump on it. We immediately get in touch with the people. We make sure they're isolated. We make sure they're getting tested. We make sure they have food, and um, and that they they have family support to make sure that they don't have to go out in the community. So we're we're all over this um, and and we're going to be all over this when the kids go back to school and and so we I just I want the administration to know that we're going to be watching like a hawk as to what happens and I want I want to be um, you know we want to be notified immediately as we will um, and, and we're not going to hesitate to shut down and we'll take a break two or three days whatever it takes to make sure we deep clean if we have a case so that we can assess where that case came from how many people they've been in contact with and seclude, you know, um, isolate and quarantine where we need to. Then we can, you know, then we can get, make the decision intelligently on data. Do we open back up and get moving again because we know we've got it under control or is it a, or is it a time where we have four or five cases and we have no idea how they're connected and we don't know how many people they've been in touch with. That's a time where you go, okay, we need to step back, close, go to full remote. Um, but right now, I feel like we are in the best position possible to get back to school and to and to try to make sure that you know we can educate our kids and supply all the information that you know and all that all the support that this whole community does so well to our teacher you know to our children um, and support the staff and the teachers who I know are scared and are concerned. Um, I just want you to know that as the Board of Health. We're going to be all over this and make sure that, you know, people are, are, you know, making sure that they're washing their hands, protection, you know, everything you can do. And of course, there'll be, you know, there'll be, you know, oh, no, this person didn't wear a mask. There'll be those issues where people are concerned. But we're going to have to learn to live with that, just like every other industry has um, to get through this. And, and hopefully we'll have a vaccine and then there'll be, you know, there'll be people that'll say, well, I'm not going to get a vaccination. That's all the stuff we'll have to deal with down the road. But for right now, I think I think the administration has done an amazing job and Darius has done, you know, an incredible job working with everybody to try and put the best foot forward. Um, and so so I'm in favor of moving forward with a with a hybrid model at this time. But I am in, you know, no hesitation to shut it right down if I see any any issues and I'll know right away. So um, I'll leave it there. I took too much time. So. Um. Uh, Jessica, I saw your note, but Bob Holla is next in line, then you. Jessica, if you want to piggyback on Trevor, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Bob. Sure. Um, so, Trevor, thank you for all that information. And I, I'm hearing that you have a lot of confidence about what's happening outside of the school building. And you said some things that did help to build my confidence a bit. A bit. But I, as an elementary school teacher, 
um, have a lot of confidence about what to expect in these classrooms, and it is unified with our teachers who every single teacher who has reached out to us, emailed or spoken, has said, our children will not be able to comply with the masks and distancing that are the primary preventives against transmission of COVID in our school. Um, a classroom situation is not at all like a doctor's office. It's not like a grocery store. Children cannot be expected to behave with the self-discipline of medical professionals. Um, and I am personally not comfortable voting for the hybrid plan as it is right now. Um, I would very much like to have a have more discussion about what a quote unquote remote program could look like, um, partly because I think there's a lot of misconceptions about it. If we did vote for a remote program, we would be prioritizing special populations to still have in-person instruction. So a lot of special education students and whatever other groups the administration deemed appropriate could still be in school and getting their personal needs met while being safer because the general student population is not in the building. Um, I think we could do what is primarily and planned to be a remote program for the general student population, but we could begin the year with some, um, some short-term outdoor sessions. We've heard a lot of interest in outdoor education tonight and through the emails and um, other comments we've received. Um, and that way, if we started with a plan like that, where we're planning ahead to be fully remote, when we're all expecting that there will be increases in our rates that will force us into closure in the future, if we plan for all remote, then we are already set up for it. And I would very much like to work on benchmarks to know when to come back. I want us back in the classroom. The teachers want us back in the classroom. Um, but I, I'm not prepared to vote for the hybrid plan as it is right now. Um, and I would, like, I would like to have a more robust discussion about what a remote program could look like and understand how it would still meet a lot of the concerns that we've heard from parents and teachers. Okay. Thank you, Jessica. <clears throat> Ashley, Dion. Can I go first? Oh, Bob, that's right. I forgot you. Sorry. That's all right. I only have a few little comments. How could I forget you, Bob? So go <laughs> I've, been ahead. On school, I've been on the school committee since my kids were at Waitley and at Frontier. They One graduated in 08, one graduated in 11. And people always ask me, Bob, why are you staying on the school committee? My wife asked me every time I go up for three years because I love the kids. I love the people we work with. Um, I like what Trevor was telling us about the Board of Health and staying on top of things. I have a wife that's a nurse at Bay State, been there since day one. Um, they take protocols, wear a mask nine hours, even though she's in her office, she wears a mask nine hours a day. Um, I think that the start with kids with masks and washing hands starts at home. If parents at home aren't teaching their kids how to wear a mask, wash their hands, how, how are we going to do it if, if you don't start at home? I was at Muffins General Market this morning, family going on vacation, a little six-year-old and a little eight-year-old. They had these little masks on because their parents taught them how to wear a mask. I really think it starts at home. It shouldn't have to start with the teacher or administrator or nurse to tell them how to wear a mask and how to wash their hands. It should start at home. Second, I have a nephew that has a wife that teaches in Barrington, New Hampshire. They're going full-time with one day of prep on protocol. We're given 10 days to help the teachers with whatever they need, with protocols for safety. Um, that's, that's a lot of prep to get the teachers ready. If they're saying they need more time, maybe we can get them more time. I think there's still gonna be more time during the course of the week. A lot, of, a lot of the what I've heard through, through the grapevine, like everybody else has, a lot of the COVID that's coming through is from large groups. And I'm not talking about kids that go to summer school. I'm talking about the kids that are partying, having parties on weekend because they think it's safe. I have a friend in Hoyoke that just came down. Him and his wife came down because their son went to a party in Hoyoke, 20, 30 people, he came down it and spread it to a lot of people. And that's, I think, where a lot of this is coming from, from those larger groups, that they think it's safe. 
I know Darius spoke a little bit about it, and, and we've been talking about it. You know, I heard about the tents. I know we're, we're talking about purchasing. If we haven't purchased them, because we have grant money, we're going to spend probably, correct me if I'm wrong, Darius, twenty to $30,000 on some tents for outside learning. I know a few people thought was, was talking about it. I think it's a great idea. I'm not sure how long we can go into November, maybe. I know they make heaters, you know, and they're expensive, but, you know, you put up sides, you put an extra, you put a sweatshirt on, and then you still have your outside learning, which, which I thought was a great idea. I talked to the Lilly family. They're getting bombarded with purchasing more tents for colleges, for, mo mo for outside learning, and for high schools like Mohawk and stuff. Um, I'm for the hybrid. Um, I'm also chairman of the Frontier Regional. Uh, so I, I do a couple different hats here. So I've been on the elementary a long time. And I'm, I've been on that Frontier for a long time also. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Now we can try Ashley. <laughs> Is Ashley still here? On at the screen. Here we go. I got it. Ooh, that's exciting. Good job. <laughs> um, I'm not. I'm not entirely sold on, on either um, way that school will be returning. Um, a lot of parents spoke about kids that have special needs or um, kids with learning disabilities. Um, I have a daughter with type one diabetes, which presents a whole nother um, series of problems. Um, oh shoot! And I don't even know. Um, <laughs> sorry. I um, there's not enough information for me to entirely feel safe with sending my kid back to school. But uh, I am not a good homeschool teacher. Um, I mean, every at 1030, I'm like reaching for that 10th cup of coffee and thinking I'm going to rip my hair out. But um, I'm just, I don't like either option. And I guess every time I drive by like Channing Beat or there's that other building that's, you know, kitty corner from Yankee Candle, I'm thinking like, instead of a tent that may or may not get us through or a heater that you may or may not need, I mean, can we look at some of these maybe um, empty buildings that are around and teachers that want to do just remote, if they feel comfortable doing just remote, then they have their own set of set of kids that they do. Kids that are parents that feel comfortable sending their kids for the hybrid model, if we can space them out. Um, I think the tent is a good idea um, in the short scheme of things, but I mean, there's not going to be a vaccine for a year or so. We got to, I mean, the winter is, is going to present a problem. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there. Okay, thank you. What you guys uh, thought. Okay, Carrie, Carrie Etchells. Yes, hi. Um, so just from the audience, um, I am also, I'm a parent too. I have three children at DES. So I'm, I'm coming at this from a few perspectives. Um, I've been struggling with this. What I've come back to over and over again is I keep hearing from families, from parents who, who just can't do remote for whatever reason, they, because they work and they can't, don't have the time to spend with their kids because they, the parents technologically can't be assisting their kids with remote. Because the kids struggle with remote so much that the parents cannot bring themselves to force their children to, to sit in front of a computer and work anymore. Remote is just not going to be able to reach some families and how, how can we make sure we're reaching them? If it's an equity issue, if the, as public schools, we need to make sure we're servicing all the children. If we can't reach students for whatever reason, we failed them. And that's not acceptable to me. Um, I'm thinking about risk. We're looking at, you know, there's a risk of coming back to school and students being sick and spreading, spreading infection. But there's the risk of not being in school for, well, it's already been several months, but six months or a year or a year and a half at this point. The families who, who aren't able to get their kids learning, the, the stress on families financially if they stay home to help their children, the, the emotional stress that families and parents and children are under. I think about, you know, I, as a parent of three, I, we struggled with remote. It was you know, if we have to keep doing it, we'll have to keep doing it. But it was hard. And that's with two parents who 
we're able to reduce our hours part time to help with kids. So there's always someone there to help their kids, our kids at school and kids who, for the most part, were able to tolerate some remote learning. And it was hard. And I think about families who, who aren't as lucky, who struggle more, just the emotional impact on parents potentially <clears throat> taking it out on their children because no one gets a break. You know, parents need a break, the children need a break. So I, in my head, I'm weighing the risk of, of spreading infection versus the risk of, of not being in school. And I, I don't, I, it's hard, you can't quantify one versus the other. Um, I also want to say that it, it shouldn't be the school's responsibility to provide childcare, but the sad fact is it is for a lot of families. Um, that, you know, it'd be great if we could fix everything else behind that, but we, we can't at the current time. There are families who rely on someone else watching their, their children at least some part of the week. Um, let's see, got my notes here. Um, oh, the other thing is I just, we just need to, whatever option we choose, I just hear a lot of concern from families and teachers and other community members that we're doing things as safely as we can. So it's with, as, as we go, we just need to be staying in communication, sharing information, being very transparent. So we're, whichever way we go, we can assure the community that we're being as safe as possible. Okay, that's it for now. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. David Sharp. I saw you unmuted, David, so I assume. Yeah. All right. I just um so I'm I'm Dave Sharp. I'm um member of the Deerfield uh, school committee. Um and so I just want to jump off of some of these um comments, uh, certainly from uh, Trevor and Ken and everybody who's thanked um, the community and the teachers and administration, obviously for all the hard work and uh, thoughts that have been put into this. Um, and certainly Emily's um, very eloquent words that we are all in this together. Uh, and so we have to keep it all uh, together. Um, so I'm um, trying to approach this also from a more try to be objective and a sort of data driven on some level. Uh, and it, it just seems to me um, that sort of the literature research that we read definitely says that remote learning is no substitute, uh, particularly at the elementary level. Um, we also, there's a lot of, you know, academic research out there and, and I think, and Carrie just spoke eloquently to it too, that remote learning uh, is going to impact Lower income, lower performing kids the most, uh, as well as the families um, who are perhaps less um, uh, privileged. Um, anecdotally, uh, remote learning in our district was spotty. Uh, and for, for some, I think it was kind of a probably a negative experience. For some, I think it was absolutely fabulous. Uh, and, and I think, again, that speaks to uh, the, the individual teachers. Um, but I think it, you'd be hard pressed, obviously, to say that it re replaces or is anything on the same uh, level. Um, I think there's a reason um, that national pediatrician organizations, uh, even our fairly uh, well-respected local pediatrician uh, groups, advocate getting kids in school, uh, saying it's fundamental to the well-being of our kids that we do everything we can uh, to do that. Um, and I don't want to go on with that, but obviously a lot of science that says that in-person schooling for our kids is too valuable to give up. Uh, we should follow the science when the risks of school-based transmission are low. Um, and to me, I've been a little distressed about, uh, in just in all of our sort of discussions about this, um, that we seem to be ignoring that we are essentially living in a COVID, I don't want to say paradise is too strong a word, but compared to the rest of the country, we are and, and Trevor, I think you, you sort of hit on this and you've got more inside knowledge than the rest of us. We are living in a, we're lucky. We are very lucky to be where we live. Um, I wanted to present something today, apparently to pre present photo bombing, we're not allowed to do that, but I wonder if Darius, if you can put up the map, just to illustrate this, um, that I wanted to put that you said I had to send to you to put up. Is, it, you, is that possible? Um, so if it doesn't come up, um, so there, I see something on the screen. I don't know if you can, okay. So, so this was a very, uh, interesting recent article in New York times, and it's an interactive map 
put together by a group of epidemiologists showing the current sort of state of the virus in America. And if you can look at this, basically the white areas um, are, are doing very well. Uh, and obviously the darker areas is where, the, where it's uh, rampaging. And obviously if you look at us, you see that we're, our little county shows up there and we're sort of snug right up to, uh, to Vermont. But the other thing this map did is it actually predicts by county and then size of school, how many cases are expected to come into the school on day one. And it can be broken down into a, a 500 person school. And if you do that for Franklin County, uh, the answer is zero. Zero kids would be expected to have COVID. Obviously we all have different levels of, of anxiety and fear about things, but we have to understand and when we talk about benchmarks and stuff, I don't know, you know, in terms of our whole country, what more benchmarks or how much better you can get essentially than uh, where we are uh, in our little area. Um, frankly, I think we all should turn off cable news um, on both sides of the spectrum because the debates that are taking place there are, are crazy. We're not Florida, we're not Texas, we're not California. For people who, you know, there's a lot of talk about Indiana this week and what happened there, but if you go to that interactive map and you plug in the county where that happened, it's not alarming at all. It was absolutely expected uh, that there would be COVID uh, in those schools uh, when they opened. Um, so to me, I just think that's critically important for us to, to uh, remember. Um, and then on the statewide discussion, again, it's a, it's a little, again, we're, when we hear statewide numbers, we should all be, um, you know, thankful that we have a governor and took this seriously. As a community, we take it seriously. We have great minds in medical community in Boston. Um, but again, there, you know, and we're doing much better than the rest of the country. But again, we are in Franklin County. Uh, we are doing much better than even the rest of our state. So if we get alarmed about things that are happening in our state, I think we should also keep, uh, keep, keep that in mind. Um, so, Again, to back to that question of benchmarks, you know, if we go remote, what's our benchmark to get back? But it seems to me there's no benchmark that, that certain people uh, that we could meet if we don't, if we're not already meeting it uh, in terms of um, a hybrid model or getting getting our kids into school. Um, schools in many parts of Europe are open and doing fine uh, full time. Um, am I advocating ignoring an increase? Absolutely not. Just as Trevor said, if we need to close down, we will. Um, but while the conditions allow it, I think we should be doing all we can um, to teach our kids uh, in person. Um, the way I understand it at the elementary level anyway, the other way to think of it too is that each classroom, I think is a pod, is, you could think of as a pod. You know, we talk about these pods outside of the school. Well, each classroom, I believe, is not going to be having as much sort of cross, you know, pollination as they, as they might um, in a regular school year. So you've got a whole nother level of of sort of safety there in terms of that group of, uh, of kids, um, you know, and, and how that, how the disease may enter the school. So um, again, I, I also agree strongly with sentiments expressed by others um, about not going back, that it's a real, it's, there is a privilege issue here for folks who, um, I'm not talking about the teachers now, I'm talking about, but folks, uh, parents and families who may be advocating remote uh, who, who can do that, who have, and Carrie, I won't, I won't repeat myself, you spoke eloquently to that about just um, certain people in our community don't, don't have the luxury of being able to, to do that, to change their work, to be, to be working uh, from home. Um, so while I know it's tough and, and my sense is that teachers are very um, uh, up, up worried and anxious about that, I, I would hope that we would look at the numbers in our area uh, and think about, the, you know, this is a place where we should be sort of leading the way and showing people, again, like Trevor said, how a good community behavior makes it possible um, to sort of get back on our feet and get, get kids educated. So I rambled on too much, but that, those would be my thoughts. Thank, thank you, David. Uh, Michael Merritt and Jessica, I did see your offer. We'll certainly get back to you. <laughs> thank you, Ken, and uh, thank you to everybody that's submitted comments either via email or making public comments on here. Um, I'll just start by saying that I am in favor of the hybrid model. Um, I um, 
I've been working as a special education teacher for over six years, uh, ranging in grades, you know, from as young as third grade all the way up to 12th grade uh, and a few years in between. Um, I also have two children that attend Conway Grammar School. Um, so that's the community that I'm in. Um, and when I think about our role as school committee members in terms of trying to come to a decision about this vote, um, I think, you know, I personally have been trying to listen to the entire community of staff, uh, parents, and just the greater community. And um, what I see is a very diverse need um, that you can hear my son in the background probably. <laughs> um, I think that our community has a very diverse need for schooling and I feel that it is uh, our school's job to try to meet that need. And I feel that the hybrid model gives us the most flexibility in terms of trying to meet that need. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I'm voting for it. Um, I listened carefully with the uh, uh, issues brought up by CPAC and other the teachers, uh, being a teacher myself. And um, I do hope that as the administration moves forward with whatever plan we do vote for, um, that we proceed thoughtfully and are willing to continually, you know, think about what is happening right at that time in the community and, and with the students um, so that we meet the needs of all of our students. Um, and I think that the way the plan is currently drafted gives us the flexibility to do that, whether it's taking kids outside for certain reasons or if we need to be inside. And um, I know from some of the colleagues I work with in the special education department in, in the district I work in, um, some of the need, need needs to be met in person, some of the need needs to be met remotely. Um, there are some services that are uh, hard to do six feet away and sometimes uh, doing a service over the internet in a one-on-one -on -one setting is the right way to go. Um, but I think all of those needs uh, are on an individual student basis, and those would be part of how the plans are uh, administered. And um, so I feel that hybrid gives us the flexibility to make the decisions that we need to do, and that's why I'm in favor of it. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, just to give people a, sort of the batting order, we have Keith McFarland, Phil Cantor, Elaine Campbell, and then I believe Katie, as Bob has told me, that Katie would also like to talk. So we would start with Keith. Hi, I just have a, a quick comment and then a question for Darius, if you could speak to. Um, looking at the Massachusetts Teachers Association put forward a, a list of proposals prior to reopening. Uh, a couple of them are specifically the purview of DESE. Uh, several of them, I think that the district has made a, a very good faith effort to try to address, but there's two that I have questions about and I'd, I'd, I'd ask if Darius could speak to them. One is computers and internet access for all. And I just want, I don't know if everybody in our district has the internet access um, to go full remote. And then the, the other question was on um, ventilation, air exchange, and um, HVAC units in the buildings. I was wondering if uh, if we've been able to address that at all. Sure, Keith. Um, well, as you know, right now we are, um, you probably may, may you have or haven't heard about the Chinese kind of embargo on computers right now, where I don't know all the politics of it, why they're sitting on the docks of China right now and not coming to us. But we, the many of the computers we ordered for this um, fall that we, you know, we talked about earlier in the spring, you know, in June and such, um, we're waiting on a delayed order there at this particular time, not going to get those until October. We still have enough computers if we run off the numbers that we ran remote this spring so that everybody can have a computer, enough smart, um, enough, um, uh, uh, what do you call it? Chromebooks rather, sorry, I lost the word. There's enough Chromebooks, um, you know, for those who had need and those families who already had computers at home to help supplement, um, we, you, know, we, you know, we're trying to get so we don't have to rely on that. Um, we're going to have to rely on that as we open schools, no matter what model we go into. 
Um, so in, in regards to internet access, there are um, still families that do not have internet access. And, and, and the schools are talking, when I tell you the schools, I'm talking about the principals, they're trying to figure out ways, um, you know, can we provide support um, to those families? And there's different, there's different programs out there, but families also have to be willing to buy, either buy into even the low cost Comcast one for internet for, for students. They have some, you know, um, some programs and that kind of stuff, but you know, we're gonna have to work with them on that as well, as well as other hotspots around town. Um, so, you know, we're still working on that. The Regarding the ventilations, we have contracted with our um, HVAC provider to go through every building, go through every unit. Um, it was not cheap um, to find out. Um, and I say it's not cheap only to people, it, it's investing money into it. It's not like we paid five bucks for someone to walk through the building. We're paying thousands and thousands um, to go through our buildings and check every single unit to check airflow, to make sure it measures up to what we're requiring. And also we're replacing out the higher MERV values on those air filters as well as looking into other um, disinfecting devices. You know, right now, the majority of our classrooms draw air from the outside. And if people understand HVAC, you know, you, you set the, you change the settings depending on how much air, outside airflow you want to bring in. One would say you always want it to be wide open, but when you're heating that air, you know, there's a cost there. And so, so over time, you start to close that. But those things that open and close those vents run on a computer. We have to make sure the computer is saying the exact thing so that we can bring in maximum air and replace clean and repair all the ones that may have been, you know, kind of limped along. And so right now um, the, the walkthrough is only going to tell us how they're working and if a repair can be made right on site. And then we're going to get a long list of repairs that we're going to have to go through to, to if, if I say long list, I'm hoping really short list. Um, I mean, we have been staying on it. There are districts where um, I'm talking to my colleagues that are in a lot tougher shape because they've, um, you know, you have deferred maintenance. We have not deferred as much in our HVAC system as other schools have had to do. Um, so, and then we'll get the, we'll have to find money as well to fix those HVAC problems. So it is our number one priority to get those air things running smoothly. Thank you. Okay, Keith. Phil. <clears throat> Can you unmute, Phil? Yep, yep, yep. Sorry. Okay. No problem. So, so, you know, I just wanted to weigh in just sort of out of respect, first of all, for um, everybody's comments and, and letters and whatnot. I, uh, but I, I believe I've read them all. I hope everybody else um, d did as well. I, I was amazed at uh, um, the original, the, the, the amount of original thinking that went into everybody's responses and um, um, the, the emotion and the, the heartfelt sincerity and, um, you know, I, yeah, I, I thought I, I think that this is a terribly difficult decision, and um, I, you know, I, I, I don't feel I, I don't see how anybody can feel really good about um, having to make this decision or and this decision at all. I, um, but at, at the same time, you know, uh, when I look at you know s s some of the responses, s some of the the benchmarks that people have requested, especially um, people that were are, that that are requesting the all uh the all online option um that, that that people are suggesting the benchmark of shut the schools down if there's a single positive case in the county um and and, and i had a real hard time adopting that line of thinking um and so so uh, you know but but at the same time i, I i think we're fooling myself if if i think that you know if to, to say that the risk is is at zero. I, 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 I the, the, risk, the risk to people's health is clearly greater than zero to do to, to, to leave your house right now. Um, and um, but all, all that being said, I, th I think you know. To, to me, what was uh, the, the the comments that I got in addition to the 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 letters that the school committee got, the comments that I got from the Conway te staff. And from the Conway parents, were um, significantly in favor of, uh, of of the hybrid model. So, and, and that really informs my my vote, I believe. So I'll, I'll just leave it at that. But thank you, everybody, and um, it's a terrible decision. And I don't feel good at all about participating in it. But um, I understand it's that's democracy, and that's what we do. So. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Phil. Elaine. 
Still with us, Elaine. I am still with you. Uh, Excellent. I, just, I, w I was looking to see if any of the principals would want to weigh in about um, their opinions about this, not to put them on the spot, but it's kind of their, um, <laughs> it's their domains and their comfort level, their staff, their kids that every day. I just uh, wanted if any of them are out there, which I'm sure they probably all are. Uh, if they would want to weigh in about their feelings about any of this. I'm glad you didn't want to put them on the spot. Elaine, no. So. <laughs> we'll, we'll see if we get a response. Um, um, Katie, while, while I wait to see, could I, could I hear from Katie? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, I lost power, but I called in. Um, so I'm probably surrounded by people that have power, but for some reason, I don't have power. Um, so I, I, first of all, thank everybody. This is, as everyone's been saying, a tough decision and not one that anyone is taking lightly. Um, but And I echo a lot of the comments. I believe the hybrid is the best solution at this point in terms of the purpose of the schools is to educate our children and we need the children to be educated. It, it will be a huge loss for this um, generation and it already is a huge loss for them. So we have to do what we can to deal with this situation, which no one had um, expected or, or um, anticipated. But my concern is that the teachers are really, it's clear the teachers are very nervous and concerned about the hybrid model and the parents, the families have the option to go remote if they want to. But the teachers, I know Darius, you spoke about working with them to get the hybrid model, to get them more comfortable with the hybrid model, to get them more on board. And I think that's gonna be critical to us moving forward. We live in a district that has a lot of advantages right now. And with relation to this situation, we have very low COVID um, incidences. We have schools that are relatively large and have a lot of outdoor space. I mean, I do feel like we have the ability to solve this for or as best we can um, for the kids and for the communities. Um, but I am really concerned that the teachers are not fully comfortable and on board and I guess We'll never be fully comfortable, but how do we help get them on board um, with the hybrid model? And, um, you know, what options do they have compared to what the families have um, in that model? Or if you could speak to that, that would be helpful. Sure. Thanks, Katie. Um, I do. I don't, I don't mean to ignore anyone else, but. Um, can, can you just follow up on the Elaine yes, question? Yes, I'm sorry. Um, yes, I'm sorry, Darius. Um, I, no, I just want to say that I don't think it's appropriate to put the principals on the spot. I mean, principals can speak out, and they're certainly they're right. But it, you know, you're, you're we're all in that hot spot, and they're in the hot spot of having to work with families, you know, torn from one side or the other. And so, I, I don't know. I, I I'm just saying that out loud, only that I understand even my own position that it's kind of it's, it's, it's awkward at times. Um, and I think we're putting them in a really awkward spot because you know. I'm, I just how I just feel about it. if you're asking their opinion. You can ask them straight up individually if you want, but I don't know. That's just how I feel um, about that. Just because, you know, if, you, if they come out and then you get parent, parents going to direct their anger at their principal about their opinion about the matter when they don't really have a choice in that. You know what I mean? They're gonna, you know, they, they were told to put these plans together and, and hand off to you. I understand they can give insight to whether or not I can work or not, but, um, you know, I, yeah, Darius, I don't mean to, I, I generally, you know, we, in our school committee meetings, we sit there with the principal and we look to them for their leadership and their guidance at, at all of our meetings. So it's kind of lacking in this forum because, you know, we don't get to interact with them, which is what we do in our school committees. We ask them for the real lay of the land and what's going on and all of that. So, you know, so it's, Right now, we don't have their voice, and it's really uh, it's it's hard to make a decision without hearing their voices because we trust their leadership and their read on their staff. And so, to have like that void, and I understand it puts them on the spot, which is not what my intention is. It's just we really respect them, 
and their opinions. So, but I, I agree with you. I don't want to put him in a bad spot. So I, I will retract my invitation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Peter Gagarin. Yeah. Hi. I just wanted to echo somewhat what uh, Katie said about the teachers. Uh, I just have a tremendous amount of respect for, for our teaching staff. And I know that many of them feel vulnerable and scared. And, you know, I'm in a vulnerable demographic myself just because of my age and, and I feel scared. And so um, I, I really do understand their concerns. Um, I am real hesitant to vote for a hybrid model unless I really feel like we have done everything possible to get them on board as much as possible. I realize for some there, you know, it's just something that they will not be comfortable with, but I think that we have to bend over backwards uh, to work with them on the things that they are worried about to see if we can take care of them. Okay. And if we can do that, then the odds of this working well, and working effectively with dealing with the kid just seemed to me to be a whole lot better. And if we go into it with a sense on the teachers that they may not ever say, but that it's like, you know, they're unhappy with their situation. Okay. It's just not going to be good for the learning and for the kids. And so, I mean, Darius, you have to figure out a way that, you know, there may be things they want that you may say, well, this is, oh, you know, we have to negotiate this or something like that. I think we're at a time where we have to say, what can we do just as we're, you talked about what we're doing, trying to do with, you know, getting the building in shape or trying to do with getting the uh, technology for people. We have to do uh, way beyond what we would normally think of doing to make sure that we can get, you know, the teacher's concerns addressed as much as we can. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, Ben, you put your name in, but I'm certainly not going to put you on the spot. If you if you don't choose choose to speak, that's fine. I, we'll understand. So, no, no, that's fine, uh, Ken, and thank you. Um, and and I don't mind speaking at all. Um, so I'm I'm wearing two hats here. I have uh, obviously the principal at Sunderland Elementary School, and we also have a daughter who will be entering kindergarten at Deerfield Elementary School um in a few weeks and whatever model that is um elaine I'm, I'm not going to uh choose a direction here but i'm going to come at it more from a a, a neutral stance and a, as the principal uh of sunderland elementary school my number one job is to support the teachers and families first and foremost and the students um when I am able to put the teachers in a position to succeed and feel comfortable, they shine. And I know that when we went full remote this past spring, our teachers really put, put their hearts on the line and did everything they could um, to make it a successful, successful experience with no remote teaching professional development and really hopping right into it from the beginning. Um, some of our students shined with the remote model. Some of our students were also not uh, very successful with the remote model either. So really in, in each situation, it's, it's a no win e either way. Um, but I do wanna emphasize that um, our teachers at Sunderland and across the entire district worked tirelessly. And I'm confident that no matter what direction the committee goes, that they will continue to do so um, they know that I have, they have my support, they have the support of the other administrators, they have the support of our families, and we'll get through this in one way or another. Um, and I appreciate all of them very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ben, for that. <clears throat> um, Jessica, I've reached the end of a list if you wanted to speak again. Uh, Maureen is stepping up. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, Noreen just came up. We'll go to Maureen first. <laughs> Hi. Um, I, I, I'm also very torn about those two plans. I, I don't think either one of them 
are that great. I agree with well, a lot of what everybody has said. But if if the hybrid plan does get voted in, I think we need to, I agree with Katie and Peter about getting the, the teachers to feel that it's safe. I also think that whichever plan, remote or hybrid, that we do need to do a lot more work with special ed from all the comments and letters and emails that I've gotten. And um, and it needs to be very clear what what options are available for families. And also the safety protocols, um, I think, need to get more specific and very clear. I know we're still working on them. And I appreciate all the work everyone's been doing. I, I was also wondering how they will be enforced. Um, and that's, so. so those are my questions. Okay. Derek, would you want to, Darius, would you want to speak or should I? Regarding how the, how the, the policies will be enforced is that is that the question you're asking yeah the safety protocols yeah i mean we're gonna have to you know i think um we're gonna have to have really clear guidelines on how we how we enforce them and what the consequences are and um because when i say that there's a broad range you know you have you may have students who are having behaviors that are connected to disabilities and we got to be cognizant of that and work with that and work with families and work be, with behavioral plans in order to address those things and you're also going to have students who um may just be playing around or that kind of thing. So, you know, we're just making bad, poor choices. And so, you know, we're gonna have to have, you know, very strict, there are gonna be strict rules regarding that. Um, and and um, in laying out those, the parameters for that. So I, I think, you know, and we will present to the school committee what those will be. You know, I think we have to, you know, we have to build those each, you know, each building is gonna have a different flavor to those, but in overall the same, um, I don't wanna say no tolerance, because no tolerance is a bad ring to it, but. We have to be very much on top of these. This is the expectation. This is what we have to do um, as students and community members in the building um, with that expectation. So. So, thank you. <clears throat> Let's see, uh, Carrie, just a question, Carrie? Uh, two questions for Darius. Uh, the first is the survey that parents filled out about their plans, preferences for going back in the fall. Is there a reason that wasn't shared with the community? Can we share those results? Uh, I know what the survey showed did influence my decision making. So I think it might be helpful for the benefit of everyone watching and listening to know what those results were. And also, uh, there's, earlier when you were talking about going back with, did I understand you correctly that there's a possibility that if we go remote, there might be a brief, sorry, if we go hybrid, there might be a brief time where we're at home as, to get teachers comfortable with this, to make sure everyone's on board. Are you saying we could just- Yeah, like I, what I'm, I'm saying, and so, you know, I, I had a conversation, you know, with the union and, and, and talking about, and again, they're, they're gonna have to also get their, they're waiting anxiously to find out what's going on here about how they're gonna react and that kind of thing. Um, but basically my, 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 my plea to them was that we have to work on this together. And I want to make sure if there's concerns about coming back, and if there's certain teachers that would come back, if those concerns are met, there are some teachers that are not going to be able to come back at all. You know, in the sense they're, they're going to have to have choices regarding their own, either their own, they may have their own uh, an illness or their own um, their own health. Rather, there may be ones that just just aren't comfortable, and I have to respect that as well. But there may be some that are saying, like, listen, I'm, I'm not I'm not certain about, you know, how are we going to just say be safe and. And when they put those, you know, and that's what we're going to talk about as union is I want to address those, you know, and if we can address those things like, I mean, let's do something that's very easy, like the HVAC system. People don't understand what we are doing to improve the HVAC and to make sure that it's safer than it's ever been before. You know, those kind of things and working with the union on that. And if I have to change the rollout of the plan slightly, and I, and I was clear with them slightly, we, we can't go on for, you know, for months um, kind of, you know, if, if uh, there's no indicators and the indicators are low and all the other things about us says we can safely go back, then we, we may have to adjust it. And I'm going to have to come back to the school committee and talk about that. But because I, I do want, I don't want to just to kind of hammer this down. This is how it's going to be. Day one is the 11th. And this is what it's going to look like on that day. Because what we said from the beginning was we were going to come up with a plan. It was going to go back to building based teams about how to implement a plan. 
And if that's going to cause that we need to do a different, Deerfield looks very different than Conway. Deerfield has twice as many, three times as many students as Conway does. Well, their orientation schedule is going to look a lot different than Conway's orientation schedule. And how are we going to do that? And we also have some unknowns about how many students we're talking about. Because as we've heard that some people are choosing, they can choose to keep their children home. And so that's going to affect your overall numbers. And that could be a positive thing for the amount of students that may be in a classroom. We may have been talking about classrooms of 12 or 16. Now we might be down to 10 if there's a certain amount of our students who are not participating um, in the hybrid mm -hmm. model. So I got to get that data and work with the teachers on that. But I did promise um, how much you can promise when you're negotiating that, you know, that we're going to work on it together. And um, I do need and want as many teachers on board and be comfortable with whatever the plan is and what, what are the barriers. And that's what I've asked for our, until our next meeting is what are those barriers that can they be addressed? Because there are some barriers that can't be addressed. There are there barriers that we can address and so that everybody feels comfortable? Because we do not, you know, I know that there's this, you know, we're talking about the splitting of our, of our, of our community. No plan is wants to put people in danger. One plan has a little more risk, you know, but it, no plan is putting people in that we're saying like, oh, we, oh, that, that makes completely sense, but we don't want to do that. You know, like we're trying to move it along together and be working together on it. And, I, and it goes to what somebody was saying earlier about, we have to bring them along, the teachers along with us. Um, they have to feel safe. They have to feel, you know, secure so they can do their jobs. Um, and it does require that next step of looking at the building-based um, you know, how are things going to be executed? Because the X's and O's are going to make the difference whether people feel safe or not, you know? And when you talk about them in general, I hand out a 57 page document, you don't see them the same way you do when you have working teams working through them, that kind of thing. Um, you also asked about the data. Um, this is the data. I shared it at the last meeting as well. I can, I'll see if, um, you know what, Sarah, if you're out there, I don't know, Sarah might be able to put it in a, um, in a, in a link so people can look at it that way. Um, I'll do a quick showing of the, the, the summary of the, of the data. Um, um, basically, it's gonna break it out by school. This is all the stuff that's hidden. Um, as we move forward to an in-person model this fall, my child's plan to participate. And so you can basically look at the, the percentages here. Yes was 46%, probably yes was 34%. Probably no is 13% and no is five, five or maybe 6%. Note that people's opinions have changed and, and recognize this. This is from when that survey went out a few weeks ago. Um, I'm only interested in remote education at this time. You know, basically, you know, 16 says 16% 16 said yes, maybe 3% said no. Um, are we encouraging families to drive? This is the percentage that we have regarding, you know, for busing that we'll be re-asking that question again um, when, uh, when we move forward. Um, and then childcare, I think is important. Um, I have childcare options available, 28%, 40% said it's a hardship, and 23% this doesn't affect me. So again, this, this data is a few weeks old. It's a data point that, you know, we looked at at one point um, as well, but, you know, you know, people ask whether or not we do it again, but. I think it's, you know, we're here tonight, so. Um, I'm, I'm finding Mary Raymond is here. And Greg, I, I, just one second, Mary. I, I have a number of people from the general public asking uh, if they can make comments again. At this point in time, our public comments are closed. And uh, we're trying to have a discussion as committees here. So I apologize uh, if I'm offending anyone, but no, I will not be uh, soliciting input from anyone that is not connected with the administration or the school committees. So go ahead, Mary, on that friendly note. <laughs> well, first, I just want to thank everybody for all of their input and their emails. And um, it was nearly impossible to get through them all. I tried to give a brief response to as many as I could, but I agree with Phil, they were so thoughtful and, and so many excellent points in all of them. Um, and also to my fellow committee members, Trevor makes an excellent point and David, I liked seeing that map. That was very helpful. Um, in, the, in the end, I think uh, for today, at this moment anyway, I would have to agree with Jessica and for the remote option, um, 
for those who don't know, I work at, a, at another school, another 7 through 12 school in the area, and I chaired the subcommittee for the health and wellness. I am coordinator of the student services department and have the nurse uh, in my department. So we put our heads together and we just said, we have to do this. And I thought, we can do this, we can do this. Um, the plan is pretty comprehensive. Um, if you're inside of the school building and in those hallways, as Jessica mentioned, things are very different than what actually works on paper. But you see the details um, and the risk and all of the duties that the nursing personnel will be taking mm -hmm. on. And it's, it's pretty daunting. But still, I thought, doable. And, and I still think it could be and might be. Um, and then after that, the story from Bay State Medical Center hit. And I think many, uh, we've had some medical people speak on, on here, and I'm also a nurse myself. And I agree with, with their perspectives and what they have said. And then I, I saw what happened there, where you know protocols and recommendations were in place. Medical people know how to do it better than anybody. And yet one person seemingly, according to the media anyway, one person's indiscretion has now infected um, many, many people. And come to find out part of that spread, which I heard um, on the news from the president speaking himself, was from staffers who were in the break room without their masks. I just think there are so many, you know, loose ends like that. I think this plan will work if everybody 100% does what they're supposed to do. But I don't think that that's something that I'm, I'm willing to take responsibility for right at this moment. I'd like to see um, what happens with the summer spike and all the um, summer happenings that have caused a spike in the cases, when those resolve a bit, when the college students come back and we know that they're all safely settled, their parents have gone home and left our area. I'm not saying I'm not in favor of hybrid, I just don't know how quickly um, that, should, that should be implemented. Um, I know, you know other schools and summer camps around the country, at the same time, I'm sure there are just as many who are having success at it. I'd like, Trevor, you made excellent points about being ready um, and having the knowledge to shut things down and evaluate things as quickly as possible. But if we're talking about that, that means somebody's become infected. And I worry about the staff, I worry about all of the symptoms, because according to the state, if any staff or student exhibits a symptom, they have to go home. They have to be tested, they have to go home. And so we all know cold and flu season and strep throats and allergies and all of that can mimic some of what's happening here. Um, so those are my concerns. I just don't feel that we can implement all the protocols with 100% fidelity, um, but I'm hoping uh, going forward that we'll figure out a little bit more. And having said that, one last point would be for our special populations, I do think we have to make some special arrangements. Special education, those struggling students who need the extra help, uh, parents who need um, support for their children, those without the internet, those kinds of things. And I think we can work on some special arrangements for them. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Uh, Greg. Greg Archaw. All right, sure. Just to uh, to jump off of what Mary just said, I, I thought in some of the comments there were some uh, more or less pointed questions around a definition of complex and significant needs. Uh, when I finish up, uh, maybe uh, I don't know if Darius wants to send a few words uh, to clarify. Is that something that we can do? Is that some a distinction that we acknowledge? Anytime, of course, a hundred percent. You have some uh, a small percentage of the students who will get very little out of remote learning. And uh, with these DESE recommendations, yeah, we're gonna look to try to serve special populations as best we can, but uh, wanted to give you maybe a chance to answer on that. Um, in general, I, I do find myself in agreement with so much of what was said. Uh, I also thought that uh, Emily made a great point in that no matter how this comes out, we're still one community. Um, 
and we've got to find a way to move forward. Um, it's nice that the New York Times is willing to send us a map, uh, but to, to Mary's point also, um, we, can sh we can spread risk equitably. Risk is on the front end before anything happens, but outcomes are always lumped. You either have an outbreak or you don't. Uh, either a bunch of people get sick or they don't. Um, and I, I do like, I think Carrie also spoke a lot in terms of risk. I like to frame this in terms of risk. Uh, there are certain words like safety and danger that tend to end conversations. I think if we frame it in terms of risk, uh, how much risk are we willing to tolerate, that may help us to, to continue to move forward. I reach out also to uh, teachers and the parents of the community to, to try to think of it in those terms. Uh, education is a real value. Um, I mean, there's the famous case uh, of Malala, uh, you know, someone who risked violence to go to school. We have in our own country, Brown versus Board of Education, where uh, students fought to, to get an incrementally better education. Uh, so the idea that, well, we should only return to school if the risk is zero, I agree. I, I think that there are many people who aren't saying that, but I just want to put out that I'd, I'd encourage people as much as possible to frame in terms of uh, we're trying to chart the path of least misery through some awful options, and there must be some benchmarks that it makes sense. Okay, now, given how important education is, uh, it, it makes sense to bring the kids back into the school. Having said that, um, I do find the stuff from the state it feels to me like it's skewing maybe more risk seeking than possibly the, the values of the community. Um, and that's where I, I want to aspire to getting kids back in the building, but I'm not in a, a real hurry. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Um, working my way down the list here. I think we're back to you. I think we're back to you, Jessica. All right, thanks. Um, so, 10 days of professional development can't change the nature, sorry, 10 days of professional development can't change the nature of child development. Um, we know from decades of research that child development is relatively fixed. No, none of our five month olds walked, none of our five year olds performed calculus. Our teachers are telling us that the kids will not abide consistently with the primary safety guidelines if we bring everybody back to school. Um, several of you are saying you want things driven by data. And from what I can tell, you're only looking at medical data. I just spent hours over the last week compiling the data from the communications we got um, specifically, specifically to look at what teachers were saying. We did not have a single outlier. They, every teacher who put time and effort into think, thinking this through and communicating with us, every single one of them said that they felt like remote is the best option. They don't think that the protocols for, they, they don't think the protocols will be safe. We, they can't do them effectively because of the nature of children in groups. They all agree on that. They feel like the attempts to enforce masking and distancing and doing constant sanitization protocols is going to create an environment that is terrible for kids' social emotional health. They will feel isolated by their physical distance. They will feel alienated from other people. They will never get within six feet of somebody all day if they do it right. And if they don't do it right, they're, they're getting punished. We can't punish children into being ready to learn. I'm sorry, we have not talked about punishment, but there's nothing we can do to change the nature of child development. And we certainly can't force them to do these things and be ready to learn at the same time. Our teachers are sharing their expertise with us. They're incredibly unified. The, the survey of teachers um, said that three quarters of them favor remote. 100% of them who wrote to us agree that remote is, is the best option. They have learned a lot about how to do their remote instruction. They feel like they can do it more vibrantly, more engagingly, um, especially given more time. 
to plan to implement primarily remote instruction. Um, I totally agree that I want our teachers on board with what we do. I don't see how we can possibly get teachers on board if we are ignoring 100% of what they're telling us. I don't see how that works. We have had the teachers union ask us to support them financially. You know, we have a lot of teachers who have to work second jobs in order to support their families. And they say, I, that takes my time and energy away from my classroom. Can you support me by having the town cover more of my health care or by increasing my salary? And we say, we would really like to do that, but we don't have the money. Listening to their expertise, their centuries of collective expertise with thousands of children doesn't cost us anything. And in fact, Darius has told us that doing a remote model is going to be less expensive than the hybrid model. So I have a question for any other school committee member who says they're focusing on data. What data do you need to hear to convince you about how children will actually respond to what we're describing in this hybrid plan? So <coughs> data, what data would convince you? That's Trevor, that's David, what data do you need to hear? Well, I think you're underestimating the, the amazing resilience in children, for one thing, and their flexibility and their ability to respond to the leadership and love and support of those around them. So, and I'm a child clinical psychologist, so I'm not sure what data you're looking for. I mean, you can find data on both sides of this argument, for sure. To stay home, to go back. Any of us can find data on both sides of that argument. But I mean, I think all the time, I have worked with children who've been through the most horrific circumstances in the world, like that you can't imagine, and they come out on the other side. And, have successful lives. So I think all the time we underestimate the resilience of children if adults around them are strong and clear and good communicators and are, are transparent as possible as age appropriate with them. Kids can do just fine. Individually, I agree with you. In and group? collectively, if they have strong leaders and support and love around them, kids can do just fine. In I actually worry more with kids in isolation in homes that we have no idea what's going on with them in their homes, cut off from all social supports, than I do with having people they trust at least some of the time around them. So, you know, not everybody's home is a is a picture perfect place, as I'm sure you know. Mm -hmm. But kids are isolated and cut off, and those that need people right now have no access to them. So those yeah. children are well, much more suited to being in a hybrid model with some support and contact than they are isolated in their homes. You know, we have a lot of privileged people in our district and we have people who are not so privileged in our district that sometimes get lost in the shuffle. And those people, you know, are desperate. We've had some of them speak up tonight, you know, when good for them for speaking up. But, you know, they're looking at losing jobs, which means losing homes, which means losing lots of things. But just kids being isolated in homes I'm actually more worried about that than I am in kids in being in a hybrid model with our people who I have a lot of trust in looking out for them all the time. So I, I just, and, and again, any of us can find data and statistics to support our position at any time, but isolated children in homes worries me. So I had my hand up. Um, Sorry. No, that, that no, that's okay. I'm glad you Trevor. I just I didn't know when I was due next. So, uh, I, 
I didn't. I wasn't watching your hand. I've been oh watching my. people talk and uh, looking at the chats, trying to trying to decipher who's who's anxious to talk. Go ahead, Trevor. Okay, so just um, just you know, on the data. So the main data I'm looking at is: Do we have a case in the school community right now? We do not. Um, you know, we, we we are in a very very good spot. I, I can't think of another you know, another area that would be as beneficial to going back to school right now, you know, as safe to go back to school right now as the one we're living in, kind of to, to David's point. Um, there will always be risk. Um, I mean, there's risk for all kinds of, you know, uh, you know on, on Maven, there, there's, there's infectious disease that comes through all the time that we keep an eye on and, and take care of and, you know, outbreaks at, at a school or outbreaks in the community of stuff. So I don't think we, you know, we, just because there are cases in the country or in the state or even in the county, um, we um, we don't shut down everything for that. I mean, we, we're stronger than that. We are going to be okay. We're going to work together. We're going to keep an eye on this. We will isolate and quarantine where necessary. Um, but really, we haven't had many, many cases at all to do that with. So I think, you know, I think until we see trends that we are in trouble, um, I, I think we can safely walk back, you know, tippy toe back into this thing, set our foot in, see how it's looking, address our, our concerns, you know, work with the teachers, try to make it as comfortable and safe as possible. Um, but just, you know, slowly, deliberately take our time and make sure that we are we are, we are doing okay. Waiting forever, I shouldn't say forever, waiting till who knows when to go back just doesn't seem realistic. I think we should, we should attempt to go back. We should attempt to constantly monitor and, and constantly change and, and listen to the input. And if there are things that are not working in school and we need to change, we change those. But we... Um, you know, we're resilient, just as the children are. We, we set the example. We're going to do fine. We have been fine. We've been a, a model community. And I think we can, we can uh, get the strength to, to set the example, go back um, slowly, deliberately, and w with the data that we have no cases in our school community right now. And then if we do, we take a step back and we wait. There's no real, you know, uh, no need to... Um, you know, still keep going if you're having cases, we, we, we can turn on a dime. And, and but I, I, I think, you know, I don't think we'll ever get to the point where we're, where we don't have any risk. This, this is going to be in our community for a very, very long time. It's not going to be three months from now, we're going to have a vaccine and 100% everybody's fine. That's just not realistic. It's going to be a couple years before, before this, this, uh, this thing is gone. I mean, usually it takes 10 years for a vaccine. We don't even know if the vaccine will be safe. So, I mean, there's so much that needs to get studied right now on this. Um, I think we're in a good place right now to take, to put our foot in, to go slowly, deliberately, and make sure that, you know, we're taking every precaution we can. And if we see something, you know, pop up, we take a step back. I mean, I, th I think, we're quick enough in monitoring that we'll, we're going to catch anything that happens pretty quickly. And, and, you know, we'll, we'll get through it. So that's the data I'm looking at is, is do we have a case right now in our school community that is causing us concern that we don't know about and, and we can't isolate and quarantine and, and take care of, and we don't right now. I agree that we should go slowly and hybrid does not feel the hybrid model we have right now does not feel like it's going slowly. I don't see why teachers will expect that you will listen to them if we don't listen to them now. They are telling us not just about the safety concerns of this model, they are also telling us we don't think that we can support our children learning in person with these protocols. They, they're, they're using the language of trauma. Was it seven or eight different people wrote in and said this, this does seem to me like it will cause trauma inside my classroom. I don't think that that's hyperbole. This is experts in classrooms and what they are saying about what looks good on paper is not going to work in their settings. Yeah. Well, so, well, um, hey. so hang on one second. Let's, uh, Trevor, I, Ashley Dion has her hand up. <clears throat> Hi, so I might have missed this and I apologize. I um, have been a little absent. Um, 
I had to do some weird shifts and weird hours during this. But um, the hybrid model that was sent out um, was sort of, you know, your sibling, the children with siblings would go on the same day to make it easier for parents. It would be that they would go on Monday and Thursday, and then other kids would go on Tuesday and Wednesday, with a Wednesday being the remote the remote learning as well as the weekend. And I'm just wondering if anybody has sort of considered or talked to or um, thought about like hiring more custodians or does it make more sense to go Monday, Tuesday in the hybrid model with a Wednesday for a deep clean and then kids going back for a Thursday, Friday, the same children so that it's not, um, so, so that I guess there's not as many germs being spread around. That's just, a, I have just that general question. And two, I, I don't want to discount anything that, that you're saying, Trevor. And um, I, just, I, I just feel like you're looking at it as, at like a, as too small of, of, an, of a map and area. And I have no doubt that you have your finger on the pulse of what's going on in Deerfield. But, you know, with, with the school of choice thing, there's, there's Conway isn't just Conway. You know, Deerfield isn't just Deerfield. There's kids that come up from South Hadley, you know, kids from come from Greenfield, kids from Williamsburg. It's not just, we're not like in this little bubble as, you know, as it seems. And I think once everybody's kind of outside now, cause you know, cause it's been such good weather. I think once people are get inside, um, I think sort of it's going to hit the fan. Um, you know, there's like, a, there's a tubing operation that's right down the road from me and every, every day, 20 to 30 cars, the majority of them are from Connecticut, Rhode Island, Pennsylvania, New York. I, I just think that November, December, when things are really ramping up, that we get into the groove of a hybrid model, if that's the way we vote. It, it'll, it, it, I'm not going to say it's for nothing, but I think that November, December, when flu season hits and we were having trouble and there's not enough tests for people, I just don't know if... A month of chaos is work is worth the work and effort and the to have families scramble in say January and for the rest of the year. But I do want my other question answered about the custodian, um, you know, the custodian having enough, you know, have do we have enough maintenance and custodians to do that model of a met, of a Monday, Thursday, Tuesday, Friday with a Wednesday shutdown in the middle of the week. Yeah, we discussed it at the last meeting, um, Ashley. Uh, we went into detail that the reason why we did the every other day model was the idea that you know the hybrid going back um, is to really is about going and looking at the remote learning and teaching students how to remote learn. Um, there is that idea that you know with flu season there is and there's also concern that we may be shutting back down. This may be all for not, or maybe it's all about um, you know creating relationships with teachers and teaching, be able to teach the kids in person at least a few days about how to do remote learning, how to access and, and build expectations around remote learning where they have some in person. The idea of the every other day um, was really, um, we, it was talked long and hard in our groups with the teachers when we had the planning groups. And the idea that you would be able to do work one day, follow up the student the next day, uh, you do work one day online and be able to follow them the next day, um, instead of doing over five days of waiting before they felt that, that break was too long and they'd be restarting, especially students who are having trouble with the remote learning early on. So that was the reason there. And we do have the ability to um, clean classrooms effectively. We would be changing the model um, of having our night custodians starting earlier and being helping out during the day and moving resources around. But we are looking at that. Okay. Thank, thank you, Darius. Michael Merritt. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm just thinking about the data that was shared tonight. Um, because of the upcoming vote that we're, we'll hold at some point soon here, um, a lot of community members uh, emailed to share their thoughts, and I appreciate all of that. And I, I uh, made every effort to read all of the responses that were submitted. Um, I'm realizing that, you know, the starting July 28th uh, for this past week, um, there are probably a lot of families that did not send in 
um, their thoughts because they may have already made those known prior to that time. They may have filled out a survey and felt that their thoughts were heard. Um, and I also know that some thought, some of the uh, letters that were emails that were sent in went to specific schools committees, not to the entire Union 38. Um, I know there was a request to forward anything that has noticed that. I was not in a position to track those myself. Um, I know that I heard uh, from teachers on both sides, uh, some uh, advocating for in-person, some advocating for uh, remote. I know that I heard from families on both sides. Um, so my concern is that uh, looking at the data that was presented tonight um, may not give us the full representation of the entire school committee, school community. Um, I think it's just what we've heard in the past week only. And so um, I just, I noticed in some of the comments that there was some numbers being thrown around and I don't think that uh, the data that was presented was able to fully capture all of the responses that were given this week because not everything was shared to the entire Union 38. And also um, not every family uh, were sent in things this particular week. Um, uh, I do appreciate uh, all of the thoughts about how our hybrid plan may need to be revised. Um, I, I think those are valid. Um, I think that's my nine-month-old uh, talking in the background there. Um, I, I feel that uh, I would, I would encourage the administration to keep coming to the school committees uh, after this vote, whatever the vote may be, um, with how we want to address the needs of all families. I feel that there are families that have students uh, that fall into that category of needing in-person instruction to be successful, but they are not necessarily part of the demographic that's been discussed tonight in terms of high need. Um, but I think that the hybrid plan allows for families that need a hybrid type of instruction to request it. And if we, um, if we don't, provide that opportunity, um, we'll be missing a significant portion of our community population that uh, is asking for it. And uh, I feel it's important that they have that opportunity. Um, in terms of teachers, uh, I myself am a teacher, as I mentioned before. And I did hear some responses from teachers that work in the district that they are in favor of doing some of the in-person. I've heard Darius talk tonight that he is uh, wanting to work with the teachers to work out issues of safety. I trust that he will do that. Um, and I trust that we'll continue to have an open dialogue as Emily Tynan uh, mentioned in her comment that we'll work together as a community to do this safely and meet the needs of the families. Um, and I think about uh, my own children when they go, if, if we end up doing hybrid and we end up choosing that, choosing to send my, our own children there. Um, but there will be difficulties with going in person. And I also remember from my own experience working at the elementary level um, that uh, the school can be a place to provide support and processing for a lot of these things. And I think that resonates with what Elaine Campbell was speaking to. Um, so there are some things that school can provide that are hard to do in other spaces. And um, I hope that we're willing to take it slow with the hybrid plan 
if it needs to be adapted and changed uh, prior to the to September, um, because the model, you know, once a vote's been made, it'll have to go with whatever. Uh, we'll have to continue to adapt whatever plan we decide on. So um, I hope that Jessica's concerns are heard. Uh, I do share some of the concerns that she raised, and I'm also uh, putting my trust in the administration, the principals, the superintendent, and the broader school committees members. Uh, to keep an eye on things and make sure that safety is being met. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, it looks like we've uh, reached the end of people wanting to talk. I know um, there are probably some that want to, to say a little bit more. I, ju I just would like to to offer some of my thoughts and, and uh, the, the, the turmoil that I've faced over the course of the summer. I um, I am a retired educational administrator in the uh, private school environment, but uh, one of the schools in the town of Deerfield. Um, people express concerns with the influx of students coming back, not just to UMass and Amherst and Hampshire and uh, Smith and Mount Holyoke, but also to the three private institutions we have in the town of Deerfield. Um, and I certainly agree with those concerns. My, my thought process throughout this has, as I said, has come and gone. I, I mean, has ebbed and flowed. Um, I have a daughter who's a teacher, a, a middle school science teacher in Needham, Mass. Uh, their efforts at planning for the coming year are nowhere near as extensive and as inclusive uh, as the effort in Union 38 and Frontier Regional has been. Um, I've had many conversations with her. She's opened her, my eyes to um, many, many issues I had not had occasion to consider. Um, and some things that stuck with me uh, in my conversations with her uh, as she contemplates what she's going to do in the fall. And, and believe me, she's uh, out there trying to figure out um, what's going on. But she talked about the fact that remote learning, you know, was a, a mixed bag for her. The kids that were committed in class when they were in, in class stayed committed, and the kids that uh, she expected wouldn't participate as, as, as uh, productively in remote learning essentially met her expectations. It did not. Um, but one thing that she said to me is, as we talked over the summer was she's very concerned about the coming school year, not just from the, for the many reasons that Jessica and the other teachers have outlined tonight, but because if they start remotely or if you start remotely, you don't have a chance to truly get to know your students or she doesn't feel she has a chance. She had six months with her kids before the doors closed in March. And she was able to, you know, identify and work with those kids. I, I've been approaching my consideration of this whole issue, uh, not just from the risk standpoint, uh, on the health side and the concerns with being able to monitor, you know, kindergarten, pre-K through sixth grade students and try and adapt uh, new social mores and uh, safety procedures and, and precautions and protocols. But I've looked at it in terms of how do teachers, and I don't know, and, and I'm sure the teachers would come back and tell me that there are ways, but uh, how do the teachers get a chance to get to know the kids? How, you know, what, what possible ways can we find to try and have some contact. And that's why I found the hybrid plan and find the hybrid plan appealing. We are in an unknown territory, uncharted territory. I've been serving on the school committee for more years than I should admit. Um, this is the single most important decision 
I will have ever had to make uh, for the schools or for the Deerfield Elementary School. I'm not taking it lightly. I'm very concerned about safety, health. I'm listening to the professionals, the teachers, who are telling us the issues and problems they foresee. However, if we don't try something at this point in time, then we're not looking at six months. We're not looking at 12 months. We're looking at 2022 in my estimation because we're going to go through the same debate next summer after having spent a year doing on, uh, you know, uh, remote learning. And we will have still not gotten the answers how to, how to train, not train, but how to implement safety protocols and find ways to teach young children safely. Uh, I view this opportunity that we have tonight to vote on a plan as an opportunity to vote on a, on a model that allows the administration, we still have three and a half weeks before the teachers would be going into professional development. We then have two weeks of professional development minimum in which to work with the teachers. And it could possibly extend longer than that. That brings uncertainty to our, our families, but I need to be confident that the staff and faculty and not just, you know, the administration and others feel confident in the ability to move forward with the plan. The hybrid model that's been suggested with the phasing in can be tweaked. The, the contact hours can be tweaked. We can still be working, you know, in school and remotely in combination. If something happens, we're easily able to pivot to full remote learning. That's, that's how I view it. It's an opportunity. If not, you know, six months from now, even if a vaccine is, is approved, we still have to administer it to 300 million people in the United States and, and how many billions worldwide. And we have no way of knowing how effective it will be or how it will impact how we live and what's going to happen. I just, you know, we have to start somewhere. We have to learn how we're going to be able to function. Yes, kids will be probably traumatized. They'll have to learn. I've got a young grandson entering kindergarten this year, and I can't picture him not being in the teacher's, you know, trying to, to run everything in the classroom. He, it's just his nature. He's always, he's excited and, and things, but somehow we have to find a way. And I was very encouraged by Emily's words saying, let's work together. I think the opportunity exists to work together, whether you choose remote or hybrid, it's up to, you know, each of the individual committee members, but I honestly believe this is an opportunity from my perspective where the hybrid model um, presents us, as I said, opportunities to, to find out if we can do it. If we can't, we shut it down very quickly and we do go full remote. I, you know, I don't know what else to say. So that's it. I wanna thank everyone for their input this evening. Um, we do, uh, <clears throat> we, as a, as a committees, are charged with approving a plan for submission to DESE by the 10th. That's why this meeting has been held. That's why many people in the audience think that minds were already made up and there doesn't seem to be a lot of um, good constructive dialogue going on. I personally think there's been some pretty pretty constructive dialogue. I know there's frustration in many quarters, um, you know, on either side of the fence. Uh, but we, we are charged with approving a plan of some type, and it has to be the three, um, three options. Uh, one is fully remote, one is fully in class, and the other is a hybrid plan. Those three have to go to DESE by the 10th. Is that correct, Darius? the 10th. Um, today is the fourth
If we were to proceed to another meeting, we've got posting requirements and everything else, we'd be acting at the very last minute. So uh, it's up to each individual committee. Um, and uh, I really don't have a, a model by which to, to proceed. I guess I could um, I could start with the deer. Or go yeah, ahead. Eric. You go ahead and start with you. Know, you can take care of your committee, but basically, you're going to hand the you're going to hear the chairship over to each committee, and each committee will go in turn to um, decide what they want to do forward because it, it becomes mm -hmm. their vote and their their discussion at that point. So, you you know, you're obviously chair of Deerfield, so you can do the, you can do the Deerfield, but then you hand it off to the chair of each committee and let them um, go from there. Okay. Um, if with, uh, begging everyone so permission, first. hang on, don't be. What's that? Conway's happy to go first if you want, Ken. Uh, it, it really, I mean, it doesn't matter to me. I, I can easily do it. It's alphabetical. Oh, it's alphabetical. Conway. Okay. <laughs> Is that reverse right. alphabetical or uh, alphabetical alphabetical? Go ahead, Conway. All right, Conway, can I get a motion um, for... Uh, I think we'll start with, since the all out of school model is out, either a hybrid model or a fully remote model, I'd like to make a motion myself fully for the hybrid model and see if I can get a second. Is that your house, Michael Merrick? That's my son. He's, he's the guy. He's Could we get you to mute? TV. There he hey, there you go. Congratulations. Could we ask you to mute, right. though? I, <laughs> so, for my apologies. Uh, for but before I mute, mute, Phil is seconding I'll make the motion. A second. All in favor? That's fine. Uh, roll call. Phil? Yes. Yeah. Michael? Yes. yes. Michael? Yes. Ashley? Did we lose Ashley? Oh, oh, there she is. No, I'm here. Um, okay. Yes. All right. Uh, and I vote yes. Uh, we are, I don't know if Denise is still with us. I am. I vote yes. All right. So Conway is fully voted for hybrid model. Thank you, Conway. Next up is, what's the alphabet? Deerfield. On to you, oh, Ken. Deerfield. <laughs> I will also entertain a motion for either the remote or hybrid model. Do we have a motion? Trevor, you need to unmute if you're making a motion or David. Yep, sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> um, this is Trevor McDaniel. I would make a motion for the hybrid model to begin the school year. I'll, I'll second that motion. Good, David. We have a motion and a second. Do we do we have any further discussion? Just I guess the you know not to prolong this at all, but I guess the main the main thing I wanted to you know I think we have a meeting coming up in a couple of weeks, uh, Darius, for some budgetary discussions for for the school, and I would really love to have a little bit more flushed out um, if, if we can you know vote in the positive for the for the hybrid model, you know, really um, a little bit how that works with the, with the building of Deerfield. I know that it's a massive building and um, I know some thought, I know it's been put, and put into that, but how the kids come, come into the building, how they leave, you know, all okay. those fine details that are more minute for each, you know, each school building itself. And then, you know, when they're not uh, teaching, you know, where the teachers are going to be, when they're doing remote, um, you know, kind of, I, I know we've I, we've heard five hours or so of instruction of, of remote. You know, how that how that kind of all plays out and works. So I know that you know once you had them, okay. you would start flushing out some of that other stuff. So I just request that at the next meeting if you could. Okay, thank, thanks, thank Trevor. You. Yep. Um, any other thoughts, Gary or Mary? David, Ken. Yep. Okay, we will move to a vote. Um, David Sharp. Uh, yes. Carrie Etchells. Yes. Trevor McDaniel. Yes. Mary Raymond. At this moment, I'm going to say no. I, I would have been surprised if you didn't. Uh, Kenneth Cutterback, yes. So it is four to one in favor of the hybrid model at this point in time. So uh, let's see. S would be next. Sunderland. 
I thought I saw Greg left the meeting. Is he still yeah. gone? Yeah, Greg's no, gone. No, I'm here. Oh, you're back. <laughs> Indeed. I, I, I hit the wrong control key. And <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so, again, I'll entertain a motion for either option. I'll make a motion to uh, approve the hybrid model. Motion. Second? I'll second it. All right. Further discussion? I'll, I'll speak. Sure. Um, I'm, a, I'm a classroom teacher. My wife's a classroom teacher. I'm very concerned. But I do think that the hybrid model provides us the greatest, greatest amount of flexibility. If there are students and uh, teachers or parents who are not comfortable going to school, they have the option to go virtual in this model. And there are students and parents and teachers who would like to go back to, to school and this provides them that opportunity. If we do go virtual, we are eliminating an opportunity for a, a big segment of our population. So I think this gives us a great amount of flexibility. And, and ultimately, I do we'll go virtual during home flu season, but this also gives me the best opportunity to meet my students and to set up what's going to happen eventually. So that's why I would propose a hybrid model. Greg? Anyone else? Yeah, go ahead, Peter. Yeah, I, I've just been really torn by this. Uh... Uh, you know, balance, trying to balance off the needs of the kids for being back in school with the concerns about the teacher and putting themselves in harm's way. Um, I guess I've heard enough tonight to feel that we are making uh, sufficient efforts to address particularly the teacher concerns. Um, and so I will support port going to the hybrid, but I certainly hope that that Darius and in our case, Ben, um, when we have additional meetings, and I'm guessing we'll have quite a few of them, uh, we'll be reporting back all the stuff that they're doing to take care of these concerns that uh, are being expressed, because, you know, this is not going to be easy and uh, good communication plays a huge role anytime things get difficult. Uh, and it's one of the things I've admired about Darius since day one as the superintendent has been his good communication. And, and I'm sort of counting on that and counting on his general uh, abilities that he showed to, to move this forward in a way that, that has the best possible chance of working. Thank you. Anyone else? Maisie, Jessica? I'm not comfortable with steamrolling the input of our teachers and their expertise. I don't see how we can have truly positive relationships with the teachers going forward if we completely overrule them. Fair enough. Um, all right. I, I am also very torn and uh, I understand Keith's point and Ken's too that we're going to be looking at this, as Trevor says, with sort of the hand over the red button, uh, understanding that uh, if there is an outbreak of any point, uh, I mean, it may be too late, but uh, the cases are low and it is an opportunity to see what works and what doesn't. And because we are likely to end up uh, in a, a remote learning situation later in the year anyway, uh, I would feel uncomfortable closing the door on the possibility here and now tonight. So I, I guess we go to a roll call vote then. Yeah, and the motion is to move right. the hybrid, correct? Yep. Uh, Maisie? No. Keith? Yes. Peter? Yes. Jessica? No. Greg? Yes. So three, two. Okay. Um, thank you, all committees. Thank you, all committee. Oh, hey, 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 hey. Hey. oh don't forget Waitley. Wait, 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 wait. I'm sorry. I got a bit, I got ahead of myself. My apologies. Waitley. I forgot Last we were waiting. <laughs> Next time we'll go in reverse yeah. alphabetical order. <clears throat> yes. Um, so I will rent, um, entertain a motion from my committee. Make a motion for the hybrid. I second the motion. Okay. 
Um, any comments before we take our vote? This I'm is really probably the... Oh, go ahead, Ma Maureen. I was just going to say I'm really, really torn. I, I, wish, I wish we could delay the hybrid by a month or something to see how the other districts in our area do. But I don't know. Go ahead, Bob. As, Bob, as, as, yeah, as Ken was saying, it's probably the hardest thing. This is probably the second hardest thing I ever had to do as a school committee member. The first time was, I won't even say what it was, but it was probably as as bad as making the decision on going to hybrid. So, but, you know, it's, 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 it's a tough decision. I think everybody made great comments. I did read every single email that came to me the last few days i was telling darius i got done at 5 24 last night and between 5 24 and six o'clock i got five more last night and then today they just kept on piggying back on top of each other and 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 you know some of them were teachers some were parents some were you know all professionals weighing in their vote and stuff um uh, a couple of the teachers, I told them to read the letter, but I, I heard at the beginning that they didn't want anybody reading the letters and stuff. So, I, you know, anybody said, can you read the letter? I told them specifically, if you want to read the letter, you can read it to the to the other people that were um, out there. So, Okay. Um, and I just want to add my comment, which is that I'm putting a lot of weight and um, gratitude to Emily and to Darius for your comments about working together. I do think that um, that's an important piece of moving forward and that we need to work together on this. And I have real confidence that we will um, and that we will help the teachers feel more comfortable moving forward um, with this with the plan. So. With that, um, I will do a roll call. So, Bob? Yes. Maureen? Um, I th I'm gonna have to say no at this time. And Katie, I'm gonna say yes. So, Waitley is also for the hybrid model. Okay, I guess now I will say thank you to all the committees and committee members. Um, there's still much work to be done. Darius, are you out there somewhere? Um, do we feel the need for executive session at this point in time? Um, no. Okay. It's just, I think it's been a long night, so yes, it has. I do it catch up. I can catch you guys up. We'll do it individually, I guess, by each school. Yeah. Okay. You know, I, I don't know. You guys insist to go in, but it's been three three hours and fifteen minutes. So. Well, well, certainly you and your team. Can I ask a question? Um, yes. Who was that? <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. I just had a question. By going going the hybrid, Darius. How is that, Bob? Well, we'll it's me. A little bit. Go ahead again, Bob. Darius, by going to hybrid, is this me? Is this me? No. You, can I, everybody hear me? You're breaking up a little bit. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Darius, with going hybrid now, does this mean some of the school committee meetings will be in a in a location where we can all meet? That's up to the chair. That's up to the people being like a remote thing. So basically, um, that's up to the chair. No matter what, you're going to have to do some sort of remote because you want to be able to, if you, right. you want to have open access during, to all during this, you know, if someone was having to be quarantined or had concerns about being in public, you want to make sure they have access. So if you wanted, if yeah. you know, obviously, Waitley is a three person committee. If we wanted to somehow um, also make it a live meeting while you're also at it, you could do something like that. Um, but it is up to the chairs on that, on that particular thing. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. <clears throat> well, we have uh, four committees. We're going in reverse order this time. Uh, four committees to adjourn. <laughs> so if... I'll make a motion to adjourn uh, from Waitley. And Katie. <laughs> uh, motion, motion from Waitley. <laughs> All in favor? Yes. 
Yes. Reverse alphabet. Okay, Waitley's okay. closed. Sun Sunderland. Motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Let's see, we got uh, Peter. Uh, yes. Jessica, I saw yes. yes. Maisie? Yes. Uh, and Keith? Yes. Greg, yes. All uh, unanimous. Deerfield School Committee. Make a motion to adjourn, Trevor McDaniel. Okay, and do we have a second? Second. Dave Sharp, second. Dave Sharp, second. Okay. Um, Trevor McDaniel? Yes. Mary Raymond? Yes. Jerry Etchells? Yes. David Sharp? Yes. And Kenneth Cutterback, yes. Adjourned at 8.15. <clears throat> Conway, can I have a motion to adjourn? Yes. So moved. Thank you, Phil. Second? <laughs> I'll second it. Michael. All righty. Uh, Phil? Yes. Michael? Yes. Ashley? Yes. Denise. Yes. All righty. And I agree also. Thank you, everybody, for all your patience and commitment. We really appreciate it. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night. Well, Good night. Good night. Thank you, Tim. Good night.